Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here today and to participate in this program. So thank you to everyone who has made this possible. I'm just going to try and share my slides now. Have some share screen access, please. And while that's happening, what I would like to do is to introduce our first speaker today, and that's Professor Ann Tarka. Ann joined the International Accounting Standards Board in 2017 from the University of Western Australia's Business School, where she was an accounting educator and researcher and had been there since 1996, and is also a chartered accountant. Professor Tarka has served as a member of the Australian Accounting Standards Board from 2014 through to 2017, and was research director for the Australian Accounting Standards Board from February 2017. She was an academic fellow of the IFRS Foundation from 2011 through to 2012. She has authored textbooks on accounting and written a wide range of research papers related to IFRS standards for which she has received many awards. Professor Tarka is an active member of the International Accounting Academic Community, having served on several boards and committees. So it's with great pleasure that I um, share this session with my accounting colleague and friend, Professor Tarka. And how we will run this session is each presenter will have around 10 to 15 minutes to speak on standard setting and how research informs standard setting. And then we will have a dedicated period of time for a facilitated discussion led by me to our panel members. And then there will be a dedicated um, time around 30 minutes for us to address your questions as they relate to impactful research informing standard setting. So I am about to share my screen and with pleasure introduce Anne. Thanks very much, Karen. As Karen said, it is a great pleasure and privilege to be here to speak to you today. I know there are many people on this call. Thank you for joining us. We are very, very pleased to be here to talk about the work of the IFRS Foundation and the IASB. Next slide, please, Karen. Comments I'm going to make are my comments, but you can find a lot more information about everything I'm talking about on the IASB website, and that's at the end of the slides. So when we talk about the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board, we're talking about the board that sets the standards. We're underneath the IFRS Foundation, and the foundation's a not-for-profit organisation. The responsibility of the foundation is a single set of high-quality global accounting standards. That's the IFRS. So that affects everybody. This is about a global community, about standards that can serve the purpose of improving the information that's available to have better transparency, better accountability, better efficiency, and in that way, better benefit countries throughout the world. Next slide, please, Karen. So our topic for today is about how the IASB uses research. So our starting point, if we think about the IASB as the board that develops the accounting standards, our starting point is that the IASB is required to do that based on evidence. And this is a directive from a, the trustees that are the oversight body to the IASB. So you may ask how it is that we collect the evidence. So if we just go back, thank you. We collect evidence in a lot of ways. We have a lot of contact with stakeholders throughout the world in all the various regions. We contact stakeholders directly through meetings like this one, but we also meet with consultative groups and national standard setters. We attend many conferences and meetings. In addition, our staff are engaged with research they do themselves. And this might also involve them doing focus groups or field testing 
with various particular participants who are concerned with that standard or issue. In addition, we access all the material that's available publicly because many people are conducting research about financial reporting. These might be the big accounting firms or security market regulators. And finally on my list is external research, which we're going to talk more about today. So that's the research that academics do on standard setting matters that feed through to the work of the IASB. In fact, the evidence parts is involved from the very beginning of a standard setting project. So in the process, we ask, what is the problem that we need to solve? There is no point in doing standard setting if there isn't a problem that needs to be solved. So we look at the problem, the nature of it, the extent, the pervasiveness of the problem, how important it is and what impacts it's having. In the work of the IASB, it is very common for a literature review to be prepared as part of the project, and that can happen quite early on. On the screen, I've mentioned three large projects that are going on at the moment, primary financial statements and goodwill and impairment. Um, they have been either have been under consultation this year or are still under consultation. In both those projects, there were many, many academic studies that were uh, read by staff. The information in those studies was considered in the development of those consultation documents. The other way that is very visible uh, in how we use research is about post-implementation reviews. And so far we've done three. They've been on the standard IFRS 8, which is segment reporting, IFRS 13, which is fair value measurement, and IFRS 3, which is the business combination standard. Now, as part of those post-implementation reviews, we conducted a literature review or we had it prepared for us and that literature review reached out and searched for any academic papers that spoke to the questions involved in the post-implementation review. So in that way, academics have a very important voice that feeds in to our process. Many of you know that we have three major standards that have come into operation in recent years. These are IFRS 9 of financial instruments, IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers, and IFRS 16, leases. The board is required to do post-implementation reviews of these standards. And I'd like to talk to you today about the great opportunity that is presented by post-implementation reviews for academic research. So on the one hand, the board needs academic research. We need that input. We need that independent evidence about the application of the standards. Then on the other side, these post-implementation reviews give you, the academics, opportunity to prepare research that will contribute to the accounting standard setting. It will also give you the opportunity to show the impact of your research. Accounting and auditing, uh, financial reporting, financial markets, these are all areas that can be so informed by academic research and the standard setting boards need that interaction with the academics and the evidence that they can provide. If you think about new standards, you can see what it is that the um, standard setting boards would like to know. So um, I'll just mention a few things that are of interest in relation to the three major standards. Uh, I won't go into all the detail on the slides, but the slides will be available for you to have and to think about what research opportunities present themselves for you in relation to these standards. Also at the end of my slide deck, we've prepared for you many links to items on our web pages that provide information about these standards. And this dates back to the time they were released, so you can have a lot of information that you can use in setting up your research projects. But back to the three standards. Firstly, IFRS 9. There are a number of changes introduced by IFRS 9 compared to the previous standard, which was IAS 39. 
I'm just going to highlight to you what these were at a high level and just flag for you that these are areas that we're interested in evidence. So for example, IFRS 9 brought in a new type of impairment for financial instruments called the expected credit loss model. This is a change from the um, incurred loss model. So we need to know how that's working, how people, what, how people have operationalized that new model. A second change is there's no available for sale category in IFRS 9. That's a big change as well. There are some people who are not happy with that change. What we need is evidence about how it's working in practice. People that are using IFRS 9 and how it's impacted for the preparers, for the users, for the investors into the capital markets. Thirdly, in IFRS 9, there are new hedging requirements. So again, we need to know the impact of those new requirements and how they have uh, impacted for capital markets and for various stakeholders. Next slide, please, Karen. For each new standard, there are transition requirements. And it's very interesting to us to know what transition requirements have been used by entities when they adopt the standard. This is really important for us, for the ongoing standard setting that we do, to know whether we provided the right transition requirements, whether they were embraced by preparers, did investors then get the information they need for a smooth transition from an old standard to a new standard. And finally, disclosures. Disclosures are a very, very important part of each of these new standards and research that can look at disclosures under IFRS 7, which is the disclosure standard of IFRS 9, um, people that can have a look at those disclosures and report on them and tell us what people are doing on the one hand and how useful they are for investors on the other hand. It's very important research for us. So that's IFRS 9. Looking now at the second of the standards, IFRS 15. Now, this is the standard about revenue from contracts with customers. And those of you who are teaching this standard to your students know that it has got a new model in there with five steps. So we would like to know more about how that's worked for people in applying the new standard, the new approach they've taken, and also how the effects are for users of the financial statements. Um, we know that for many entities, the amount of revenue didn't change significantly, even though the approach to revenue recognition changed. And one of the things that could change for people is whether they're recognising point-in-time revenue or revenue over time. So we'd like information on that. The standard also brought more guidance on some of the thorny issues in relation to revenue recognition. And studies may choose to investigate those particular things. And the importance of those varies by industries and indeed by countries. So this is an opportunity for people to do specific research that is important, not just to the IASB, but is important in their own jurisdiction. Next slide, please, Karen. Uh, again, I've mentioned transition and I've mentioned disclosure. So for the same reasons I just said for IFRS 9, Disclosures about transition and information about disclosures are important. The IASB has been looking at how to improve disclosure requirements within standards and wondering whether a new approach would be helpful. And this new approach would, would involve more disclosure objectives and less disclosure requirements. So by that, I mean an overarching objective for the disclosure versus less lists of items that need to be disclosed. And the idea behind this is to improve the disclosures that are provided so they are less boilerplate, so the disclosures provided are more useful. And this is part of our response to a problem that has been identified years ago called the disclosure overload problem. So we're working on that, and if you can look at IFRS 15 and the two other new standards and provide any insights about using disclosure objectives, we would be very interested in that work. Finally, on IFRS 16, this is the leasing standard and this is the standard that brings many, many leases on balance sheet. 
So more capitalization of leases. So we're interested in all those similar questions. What are the uh, benefits for the investors and for capital markets of changing recognition of leases so the information is not in the notes but is actually recognised on balance sheet? Are there any behavioural changes that follow from the change in the accounting standards? Next slide, please, Karen. Uh, again, transition and uh, disclosure research. Very important for us. So finally, my final slide. I would encourage you to look at our work program. I would encourage you to consider research for post-implementation reviews. We, I started my short talk today saying what the objectives of the IASB and the IFRS Foundation are. And to achieve those objectives, we need to know how the standards are working in practice. We're seeking consistent application of standards that reflect the economic fundamentals. So we need to know the evidence for all our stakeholder groups. With that evidence, we can make changes to standards if they're required. We can also improve our standard setting in the future. So we do value the input and I appreciate the chance to speak with you today and I'm looking forward to your questions and providing any more insights I can in response to your questions. I'm going to stop now, but I just remind you that in this slide deck, uh, after this slide, there are many pages of uh, links uh, that can take you to all the supporting materials on IFRS 9, 15 and 16. So they'll be available for you should you like to do research in this area. So thank you very much, Karen. Thank you, Anne, for providing those insights into the various mechanisms and means by which the IASB <laughs> utilises um, accounting research. So what we will do now is it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Roger Simnett. And Roger is the current Chair and CEO of the Australian Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. And he's a Professor of Accounting at UNSW Sydney Business School. He's also a current member of the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board and the New Zealand Board as well. He's recognised as a leading international auditing and assurance researcher whose current areas of interest include improving the measurement and assurability of corporate reporting, both financial and non-financial disclosures. Roger's research has appeared in the leading journals, including the Accounting Review, Accounting Organisations and Society, Auditing, a Journal of theory, uh, Practice and Theory, and Contemporary Accounting Research. His contribution to academia and the profession have been widely recognised, including being a recipient of the Order of Australia. So it's with pleasure I now invite Roger to present on research, um, academic research and its role in informing auditing and assurance standard setting. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chalmers. And uh, welcome, everybody. I must admit I have done a number of seminar presentations uh, around the world this year. It's the new way that we are working. And I think this is the biggest audience uh, that I have presented in front of uh, for this year. So congratulations to the organisers. Uh, congratulations to all the participants as well. Again, uh, like Professor Tarka, my slides will be available. Uh, so I would encourage you to listen. Uh, and you'll get the slides at the end. Um, again, as we work into this, what Professor Tarka presented for the IASB is a very similar process to the IAASB. Mm -hmm. And so it is important to understand the stages of research. Certainly at the problem identification, we look at all the research that's available. As the standards work through a process, uh, we look at, the, uh, at how the standards can inform that process. And again, as Professor Tarka said, in the areas of post-implementation review, it's very important that we know whether the standard is working as intended. Uh, I'll take the next slide, thanks, Karen. So what we will cover today is I will tend to, rather than go through those uh, specific stages again of where research can inform standard setting, I will try and look at a 
area of project identification for researchers. And I'll do that by looking at the IAASB's work program and how that has changed and transitioning to a new strategy. Uh, I'll also look at the focus areas and spend a little bit of time on areas where I see some research opportunities. And then I'll give you some high level views of what I see as the ability to take the current research to inform standard setting and some of the difficulties we have with that. And I'll also represent the IAASB's response to COVID. Before we go on, Karen, I'll just make a comment. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I'll just make a comment. There is a difference between or, uh, accounting standard setting and auditing standard setting. The, the IASB uh, looks very much at accounting information on a subject by subject matter, such as under the outlined by Professor Tarka, areas like hedging or leases or revenue. Uh, so they are fairly discrete areas. The IAASB standards in auditing uh, are much more of a process. So it is a continuous process which is broken up into stages. So you're looking at how you can inform the individual stages, such as the understanding of the entity, a risk assessment, evidence gathering or auditor reporting. Uh, it is important that we do this work. It's important that we rebuild trust in the profession and society. And the only way we can rebuild trust in the profession and society is to make sure that we get our reporting right uh, and that the reporting faithfully reflects the underlying conditions and circumstances of the entity. And that's the IASB's role. And that people trust that information which is being reported. And that's the IAASB's role, the area of auditing. So we'll go on now. Next slide. Thank you. So what we see at the IAASB, and it is consistent around the world because 130 countries, not quite the same number as the IASB, 130 countries use our international standards uh, and are so are seen as converged to the international standards, including Indonesia. We have concentrated in the last five years on basically making sure that we have the foundation right, the what I would call the very technical areas, uh, risk identification, the areas of complex accounting estimates, and are we getting those right? And that's the areas where there's big judgments, areas of group audits, areas of auditor reporting, uh, are, are some of the major areas we have concentrated. And we are going to need research as we work through to make sure that those standards which we are put into place are working as intended. So we will be able to again look at how those standards have affected decisions, decision makers and society to see whether they are having the intended consequences. That is part of what we call the post-implementation review when we get to that stage. We are working through the post-implementation review to see if the auditor reporting standards, which we outlined, are, are working in those areas. Going ahead, some of the major areas are areas more of public interest, going concern and fraud, areas we keep on hearing about that we need to do more work on, areas of audit evidence, uh, and uh, some of the areas, as well as the non-financial information, so sustainability information, integrated information, how best do we account for all of the available public interest reports that are being put out there, as well as the impact of technology on both clients, on producing information and impact on auditing, and auditors as how they use the information. Next slide, please, Karen. So let me go on to fraud and going concern, which are key public interest topics. And as we consult around the world, we keep on hearing. So we are at the exploratory stage, the research gathering stage, looking at all the evidence that is available. Fraud and going concern are really built around expectations gaps. Are the auditors doing what everybody expects us to be doing? Or do we need to do more? And if we need to do more than what is in the standards, what is that? So we need to identify that. So we will go through a consultation your, your national uh, standard setting organisations uh, and your national accounting bodies will be involved in that consultation and it's important that we hear from you. 
It's the same with going concern. Do we have the going concern right, especially in this current environment, which has put so much financial stress on organisations? So uh, do we have, um, are there concepts of resilience? Do we need to do more on the reporting of what the auditors have done? Do we need to do more on the reporting? And Professor Tarka will be hearing this, especially from the auditors, as to what management are reporting in this particular area. They are questions. It is important that everybody from the reporters through to the boards, through to the external auditors, be involved in this process because it is a whole financial reporting ecosystem. So that is an area of potential research. Next slide, please. Non-financial information. So as well as getting the financial information right, to ensure there is a greater demand for information on many uh, subject matters, including climate change, uh, including modern, what we call modern slavery, uh, including uh, uh, social and governance and whether the organisation is doing the right thing. We actually write our assurance standards to cover the whole range of uh, subject matter reporting standards there. So we write those standards. But are they standing up? Is there other things we should be doing? And we are continuing, continually testing ourselves. We have some standards on specific subject matter information, such as climate change, greenhouse gases, uh, and that is an area of uh, considerable significance at the moment. But we're always interested to hear as to what other areas of non-financial information we should be uh, looking at and how that is set up and who is reporting on that are areas that are being considered around the world. Next slide, please. Technology. It's interesting, as we worked into this health pandemic through COVID-19, we were already in an area, uh, in, in, the, in a time, an era of significant change and disruption, mainly through technology. Uh, and so that's changing the way that accounting information is made available, uh, it's, it's prepared, it's collected, and it's also changing the way that auditors need to work uh, and enabling. So it's a it's a great enabler and, and uh, it's very interesting with COVID as to how resilient organisations have been. So we are working with that to make sure that our standards do not stand in the way of innovation, of technology, that our standards actually support relevant information and best practice in these particular areas. So we will work in those particular areas, as you can see, and you can refer back to these slides. Next slide, please. Uh, so understanding, and this is the area we're going through on post-implementation review. So we want to hear from everybody as to whether the work that we did on the new auditing standards, which came into place 2016, 2017, whether they are working. Uh, we have required more information. What does the auditor see as the key audit matters? How is that being reported? How is that being used? We need to understand. We've had enhanced reporting on going concern uh, and we've had enhanced details trying to describe the process. So we, we encourage anyone who has research. That area is actually available now. That is open. The, there is a stakeholder survey of the IAASB that is open now. I would encourage people with any research to feed it into that particular process as you do for the uh, as the as you do for the accounting standards boards, uh, feed it through for the auditing standards boards. Next slide, please. Let me just give you a few highlights as to some of the issues that I see on the research that we are currently doing as a research profession, as an academic profession, and I think that we can improve on the way that we inform standard setting as an academic profession. And I'm looking at two uh, areas of research here, which is archival and behavioural. And these are fairly significant surveys that were done as to how much the research has been aimed at informing standard setting. And in the archival research, and this was over 130 articles outside the US, so this is areas in all other countries outside the US in eight leading journals. 
only 10, less than 10% of those articles referred to auditing standards. And of those 10 that referred to auditing standards, they basically motivated the area from the auditing standards and then never came back with any implications. So as an archival group of researchers, we can do more. We can look at those areas where there is information available and we can aim it at these particular areas. We are in an area of evidence-informed standard, standard setting. We really do want to understand those. On the behavioural, much better. Uh, there was about 20 to 30% of articles which actually referenced, uh, nearly 40%, which actually referenced international auditing standards. Uh, it was on the emphasis stage of the process of the what I would call input processing and outputs because we are a part of a process. They really emphasised the process by which auditors were done. We did see some trends there. Uh, there is less controlled experimental design. There is less access to senior auditors in those particular areas. Next slide, please, Karen. So of those areas, we can see that they are complementary. The archival tends to work on what I call inputs and outputs, uh, such as audit fees or audit effort uh, or audit reports, uh, and the behavioural tends to work on process. And that's important that we see those. We do see that researchers are not clearly articulating why the research is of interest to standard setters and regulators. Yet this is our natural domain of influence. We should be trying to influence people with our research. That should be why we are doing it, to inform people who are going to use our research. We need research ac academics. We need research from people who are independent, who are trained to do research. So very few uh, research, uh, and, uh, and most of that is very general, and the implications are very difficult for standard setters to take away. We need to make it easier for people to understand the implications. Last slide, please. And on the IAASB's response to COVID, we have found that the world has responded and adapted very well. Uh, we have uh, been very adaptive to our change in work practices, we've assisted, uh, and we've coordinated across groups. Uh, so we can, we can move quickly when we need to. We've also learned that our standards stand up well in this time of extreme stress testing. So, uh, so that is good news. Principles-based standards stand up well. So many research opportunities, many ways in which we, as, a, as an academic profession, can inform. Thank you for your attention. I'll pass back to you, Professor Jones. Thank you very much, Professor Simnett. We've had the... Um, benefit of hearing the insights of Professor Simnett and Professor Taka, both of whom engage in significant and impactful academic research in um, financial reporting and auditing and insurance, and both who are also able to bring the perspective of being a standard setter as well. So our final speaker, but by no means um, less important, is Professor Donna Street. Um, Professor Street is a Chair in Accounting at the University of Dayton. She serves as Director of Research and Educational Activities of the International Association for Accounting Education and Research and previously served as the Association's President, the Vice President Research and Vice President Communications. Professor Street coordinates the IAAER KPMG Research Grant Program that informs the IASB. Professor Street has previously served as the President of the International Accounting Section of the American Accounting Association and received the Section's Outstanding International Accounting Educator Award and its Service Award. Professor Street's research focuses primarily on international financial reporting issues, including compliance and segment reporting. So it's with pleasure I invite Professor Street to again talk about impactful research and how organisations, particularly academic organisations, can contribute to this process. Okay. Thank you, Professor so Street. 
Okay, so I will share my screen. Hopefully it will work. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Karen, for that kind introduction. I will continue along the stream that Roger and Anne started, and I will focus on IAAER's contribution to research that informs standard setting. Today's seminar is very in line with the mission of the International Association for Accounting Education and Research. Our mission is to maximize the contribution of accounting academics to the development and maintenance of high-quality, globally recognized standards of accounting practice. We do this through collaborating with standard setters such as the International Accounting Standards Board and the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. We also have cooperation from funding partners and also the Journal of International Financial Management and Accounting. Elizabeth Gordon and I are co-editors of the Institutional Perspectives sections of GIFMA, and we aim to publish research that informs standard setting. Speaking of the Journal of International Financial Management and Accounting, I wanted to refer to a commentary that Elizabeth Gordon and I did in 2013 where we addressed uh, the importance of evidence-based research for the International Accounting Standards Board. Next slide, Karen. In this commentary, we discuss issues emerging from a series of IAAER roundtables. In these roundtables, we discussed issues such as whether academic research is relevant to standard setters, and I think this was an issue that Roger touched on towards the end of his presentation. We talked about the types of academic research that would be most relevant to accounting standard setters. Perceptions on why academic research is not more useful to standard setters and the challenges that academic researchers have in engaging in standard setting. We argue that we need to bring academic work, literature, and researchers to the ISB's attention and address issues such as how to make academic research findings available to standard setters in a timely manner while managing delays associated with quality control and peer review. This is an issue that really surfaced during the roundtables. Frequently, academic researchers are producing research that comes into the journals after the standard setters have lost interest in that topic. We need to find a way to address that. We also discussed in the roundtables how to assist researchers in gaining access to certain types of information, knowledge, and data sources, such as what if you need to interview analysts? What if you need to interview investors? I know that Anne and I have addressed this issue as co-authors, and we've also addressed this issue when we were working to manage research grant programs. When I had conversations with the leadership of the International Auditing Assurance Standards Board a couple of months ago, they discussed the importance of getting information from investors and how it would be helpful if academics could help them. In our commentary, Betsy and I mentioned that IAAER is willing to continue its participation in efforts to increase the research activities and research capacity of the IAAER. ASB. As Karen mentioned in her introduction, we believe that our grant program with KPMG is an example. Next slide, Karen. We have just started round seven of our IAAER KPMG grant program to inform the International Accounting Standards Board. This program promotes research directed at developing theory and evidence to inform the IASB's decision process. Our call for proposals indicated that we had an interest in any standard setting project or research project that the ISB was currently working on. I have four examples here. As Anne highlighted, we also welcomed research to inform the post-implementation reviews that she mentioned. Another item that we were looking for was evidence on the effects of recognizing items in other comprehensive income rather than profit or loss. I think Anne would agree with me that the IESB continues to be interested in all of these topic areas. Next, Karen. Here you can see a list of the five projects that we are funding due to uh, under this grant program. So I believe that Anne and I will be meeting with all these teams in about a month. And the great thing about this grant program is that these 
teams will get to present their preliminary findings to the International Accounting Standards Board. They'll go work some more. They'll come back and present interim findings. They'll go work some more, and they'll come back and present their final results to the board. So these teams get to interact with the International Accounting Standards Board while they're working on the project. I think this addresses some of the issues that Betsy and I mentioned in our commentary and that Roger mentioned in his comments today. We have to, as researchers, get information to the standard setters when they need it. Next, Karen. Anne was kind enough to share with me earlier this morning some examples of the projects from the KPMG IEA or grant program that have been useful to the board as they deliberate on certain topics. Here on this slide, she shares a couple of publications that have come out of this program that were useful. And Karen, if you'll go to the next, there's another example. So I won't talk about these. The point that I'm making is that when the board deliberates and discusses topics, staff papers, et cetera, do go back to the research that develops out of these programs, and it has been useful to the International Accounting Standards Board. I'll also notice that of the examples Anne gave me, two appeared in the accounting review. So I think these teams had the best of all worlds. They were able to influence standard setting which Roger said is a very, very important thing. They were able to interact with standard setters and they were able to publish in one of the top journals. Next, Karen. I would also like to mention a couple of uh, projects that I believe we published in the Journal of International Financial Management and Accounting, the Institutional Perspective section, which IAAER manages, that have assisted the IASB. Ann and I worked on a project and literature review that informed the post-implementation review of IFRS 8. That was when she was an academic fellow at the International Accounting Standards Board. It was great working with Anne, and it was great that the board was very receptive of our project. At the request of an IASB board member, IAAER put together a team to develop a comment letter on the ISB's discussion paper on the conceptual framework for financial reporting. This included a comprehensive literature review. Again, here's an opportunity where the IASB came to IAAER and said, we need this. Can you put together an academic team to help us out here? And Ann and I are working with a team right now. They had a grant, round six, from the IAAER KPMG grant program. They had a very extensive database very interesting project, and we believe that there's even more that we can learn from that database that they have. So they're working to do more to inform the IASB, and we are going to publish the second uh, part of their research in 2021 in JIFMA. Next, Karen. In addition to having a grant program to inform the International Accounting Standards Board, IAAER has worked with various sponsors to fund three rounds of grants to inform the International Auditing Assurance Standards Board. I'm sure it doesn't surprise anybody that on this list of some of the grants that were funded in round one, Roger had one of those grants. Uh, next, Karen. Also, as Roger was sharing with us some of the projects that the IAASB worked on in uh, just a few years ago, one of the topics was group audits. As part of our round three IAASB grant program, we were able with support from the Scottish Institute to fund a grant program that helped the ISB, the IAASB receive input on group audits. And if you want to learn more about this project, there is a link here to ICAS's website. Next, Karen. I'm pleased to share that the IAAER and IAASB are in discussions regarding potential future collaborations. And this is just a list of some of the topics that came out of a meeting that we had a couple of months ago. These are areas where the IAASB leadership said it would be very helpful to have academic research on these topics. You can see that two of these are topics that Roger touched on, COVID and assurance of non-financial information. The current plan is to continue the dialogue in December, narrow the list some, and hopefully we will commission some papers that we can encourage uh, academic teams to work on for publication in the Journal of International Financial Management and Accounting. Next. 
Roger and I are also working on a paper that we hope will be beneficial to the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. This stemmed out of my work with the UNCTAD ISAR Accounting Research Network. They had a webinar in June of this year, and I said, would it be possible for us to develop some of the material that came out of the webinar and publish a report in the Journal of International Financial Management and Accounting? Roger and I are working on this, but we also have a team, Van Heck and Venter, who are just about to finish a very comprehensive literature review, research on extended external reporting assurance trends, themes, and opportunities. This article is going to be open access, and it presents numerous opportunities where we as academic researchers could inform the work of the International Auditing Assurance Standards Board as they work on EER report uh, assurance. Next, Karen. I just want to touch on Anne's references to post-implementation reviews. I had the opportunity to do a couple of projects when I was uh, focusing on IFRS 8. The IASB board and staff members that I talked to told me, look at the feedback statement, look at the basis for conclusions. Here you will get your research questions. Here you will find the questions that we want answers to. I would encourage you, if you're working to inform the IASB on a post-implementation review, that you look at these two documents. They were very helpful to me as I worked on the publication that I mentioned here. Next, Karen. Another area of research that I don't think was mentioned by our first two speakers is research to explore the anticipated impact of a standard. This would be in terms of uh, the International Accounting Standards Board. Uh, here's a couple of examples. As I worked on these two projects, the IASB board and staff members were very, very interested, and they called my co-authors and I in quite often, and they were very, very grateful to get some information on what the impact of the standard might be if they went forward with the proposals they had out at the moment. Next, Karen. So, in finishing, I would just say... Standard setters need and desire help. We just heard from two of them. Visit their websites and gave you a lot of links to go to. Talk to them, network with them. So, and, and I think that I want to add that they should stay on the lookout for the call for papers for your research forum that you have coming up. I don't think that you mentioned that, so I wanted to put the plug in for you. That's all, Karen. Back to you. Thank you very much, Professor Street. So having heard from our three speakers, what I would like to do now is to invite each of the speakers to a facilitated a question and answer session um, with me firing the questions and asking them to respond to those questions. We'll do this for about 20 minutes and then that will leave sufficient time for us to also address questions arising from this presentation that um, may be of interest to our audience. So um, these are not necessarily directed at any um, individual presenter specifically, so I encourage um, anyone to uh, respond. What we've heard in terms of very, very clear message is that research is important and has a role to play in the due process and deliberations of the standard setting boards. So perhaps can I ask, and this probably is directed to either Anne or Roger, you bring an accounting or auditing assurance um, perspective from both an educator and researcher to the standard setting boards. How important is it to have diverse experiences and representation on the boards? Thanks, Karen. I'll start, if I may, if that's okay with Roger. Um, this IASB has 14 people on the board, and they come from the regions. So for Asia Oceana, we have myself and several people. But the aim of our board is to have a wide representation of people of different backgrounds. So that includes um, preparers and investors and auditors. And we're very fortunate at the moment on our board to have two people with uh, extensive academic background, myself and Professor Tom Scott from Canada. 
And I think that it's the combination of all those people that works well. You wouldn't want your board to be too heavy in any one area, but in combination, the way the board can work. And I find my colleagues are very open to hearing about academic evidence, indeed very keen to see academic evidence. Um, equally, uh, Tom and I work a lot with staff and we're able to explore these papers uh, of evidence with the staff. So I, I think having the Davos board it, it really contributes to the outcome in the standard setting process. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Um, perhaps if I can ask Roger this, in, for those that may have been on the webinar that we held last week, which really focused on accounting education and with a particular lens on ICT, online delivery and professional scepticism. And if I think about... Um, particularly professional scepticism, what this saw was independent standard setting boards, the ethics board, the education board, the audit and assurance boards forming a joint task force given that the topic of professional scepticism was on each of their work agendas. So, Roger, do you see more collaboration across the boards occurring? Thanks, thanks very much, Professor Chalmers. Uh, at, certainly at the IFAC level, uh, the boards that sit under IFAC, there is much more collaboration that I've observed over the last three years. I spent two terms on the IAASB uh, and there was little collaboration between any of those boards before. So it is very important that we look at the intersection, uh, that we have common interests because we've got to get constant messages out there and we can learn from each other. So the, the collaboration is very important, and I know how important you are in helping drive that collaboration, Professor Chalmers, um, uh, but very much uh, I, I see it as important for the consistency of messaging. I can, we can observe inconsistent messaging coming from some of the boards, and it's very important that in the current environment where we're building trust that, it, that we get that consistency messaging. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Donna, the IAAER has a respectful and a sustained relationship with standard setting boards. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate what the origins of this were and how the success of these relationships is measured. And do you see examples of this operating at sort of local jurisdiction levels? I think that question goes back even further than I go with IAAER, if that's possible. But I know that when I first came into the organization decades ago, we had leaders that understood the importance of interaction between academics and standard setters. Uh, the IAER was already involved in an advisory capacity with what was then the International Accounting Standards Committee, and that was a cooperation uh, was basically one seat, but it was shared by IAAER, the EAA, and AAA, where they would meet with the, uh, the, the board and uh, the committee at the time and provide input. But I think it's a matter of having academics who are aware of the importance of standard setting. And to Roger's point, during his presentation, he said one of the most important things that we can do as academics is to inform standard setting. I think having that mindset, and that has been the mindset of former leadership of IAAER, I know it was very important to me when I became vice president of research that's when we started the KPMG grant program. I thought that's where we could make the contribution. And I know that you have been of a similar thought process. But I think it's just having leadership, and that's what we believe, and having the support of our executive committee and our members. Can you have that at the local level? Yes, but you've got to have an academic community that's willing to network, reach out, and participate in the standard setting process. We definitely have it in the United States. And I believe that in Europe, through the European Accounting Association, you have very, very active engagement. It takes a tremendous time investment on the part of academics to make it happen. Thank you, Professor Street. If I can just pick up on that theme, um, because one of my questions was more generally around as an accounting and auditing profession, do we have sufficient interactions between academics and practitioners to drive impactful research and informed practice? 
And given that on this panel we've got uh, people that have been um, in leadership positions in academic institutions, in particular accounting schools, uh, what in, have we got the incentives right to promote this interaction? Perhaps if Anne or Roger would like to respond first. Thanks, Karen. Uh, there there is a, seems to be a small number who are very committed and work very hard at bridging between uh, academia, the standard setting, and, and practice. Uh, we would welcome more to join that number. Um, in my experience, academics that are also linked to practice um, can have a sharper focus in their research. Uh, academics that go out of their way to interact with the practitioners and find out what the issues are and address those issues in their work are more likely to provide the evidence that the standard setters and the regulators and the policy makers can use. It is in the academic's interest to do this because this is a way that they can demonstrate and make their contribution. And many academics do want to make a contribution through their research. So um, being connected is a way to show the impact and many universities now are calling for researchers who have public dollars funding their work to show their impact. Um, so in short, I think there is there are people who are connected, but there's scope for much, much more. Um, and I would encourage people to find ways to be connected. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. And I think Professor Street gave us a, an um, example through the KPMG IAAR research grants of, of how the dual benefits can be achieved, quality publications as well as very impactful research. Um, Professor Simonet, if I just ask your views, did you do anything specific at UNSW to both recognise and value this interaction or create incentives to promote it? Uh, thanks, Professor Chalmers. Uh, look, I think it's a difficult question for universities because they recognise the the importance of impact, and it's probably easier in some professions than others. And we and we struggled a little bit with it in accounting and auditing. Uh, it's important from from both sides. It's important for the researchers to make their research available and to think about as a researcher, why am I doing this research? And really, you're doing this research to produce new evidence to inform someone. And in many ways, the best way to inform and impact is through standard setting because you get broad reach if you impact on the standard setting. So I think that there are ways of doing it. Uh, certainly, um, and from the standard setters, we have to set up systems which make it easier for people to interact with us. I don't have the time to talk with every researcher. I have to have systems which will able, enable researchers to build in. The work that IAAER is doing is, is just fantastic. You know, that's exactly where we need to be on the intersection. And you can see the win-wins for people as a result of that. Uh, we need to set up better systems than that to encourage more of those types of uh, opportunities. So, so always think about your research, who you're influencing, uh, and we'll try and set up systems which will make it easier for you to, uh, easier for you to interact with us. But try and make your research relevant to these particular standard setting groups. Karen, could I add something? Absolutely. I, I think a really good example is an experience that I have had um, the last couple of months in the discussions that we've had with the International Auditing Assurance Standards Board. We included a practice member of the IAA or advisory in those initial discussions. The individual just so happens to be a PhD who taught for several years, and now he's a very senior partner with a big four firm. But having the academics, the standard setters, and this individual in these discussions, it's just tremendous how much he adds to the discussion. Thank you. And, and I know our host university, UGM, has AACSB accreditation for the business. And if we look at recent developments in terms of the AACSB accounting accreditation, of course, now they have introduced the requirement to have uh, a practicing accountant on the panel. So I think that sort of also shows um, the recognition that we need to be working together and in tandem to achieve um, what we need to achieve as a profession. 
If I can now ask um, an area that's getting a lot of attention at the moment and pro um, prompting a lot of discussion is associated with um, what's occurring, re a call for a new sustainability standards board alongside um, the IASB. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on these current developments to trying to achieve a single set of widely accepted standardised indicators for companies to report on their ESG performance. Thanks, Karen. I'll start. I know Roger will have important comments as well. So the trustees of the IFRS Foundation have released a consultation paper. So when I was speaking, I explained that there's the IFRS Foundation and the board responds to the trustees. So the trustees have released this consultation uh, paper and they've released it in response to um, calls from other entities. So this is demand driven. This is not the IASB looking for more work for itself. The IASB is the standard setter for financial reporting for public com listed, listed companies. However, many people have identified the diversity in requirements and the diversity in frameworks right around the world in relation to sustainability information. Um, and this year in particular, there's been such a focus on the need for the world to work together for global responses to global problems. So this diversity has caused concern for people. And so out of that concern has come the consultation paper where the trustees of the IFRS Foundation are asking, uh, is there support for uh, a board that would um, issue standards in this area. So it's a consultation we have to hear. So please um, respond to that consultation. We need to hear from people. They need to hear uh, before they decide on next steps. Thanks, Karen. Professor Simner, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, I, yes, I do, Professor Chalmers. As you expected, I might. Uh, let, let me uh, look. And part of my presentation was I think that there is just so much interest in such a broad range of indicators now. You know, uh, the society and public are very concerned about things like global uh, climate change, uh, sustainability. Uh, so there, we need to get that information as relevant as possible and as reliable as we possibly can. There is a large range, you know, Professor Street and I are working on, on the paper, I think Professor Street's been blown away with a large range of um, reporting frameworks that can possibly be reported under. Uh, so uh, I really welcome the consultation. I think we are at a level of maturity now uh, where we can have that consultation as to what's the best way forward in this particular area. And certainly for organisations too, um, you know, that, we're trying to get uh, we're trying to get a, a situation where rather than producing many individual reports, let's produce one report so we understand how an organisation is operating across all of these types of areas. Uh, I would encourage that. From the assurance side, I think we're okay uh, because we have assurance uh, standards which can get cut across. We have to make calls as auditors whether or not those frameworks actually meet what we call suitable criteria. To, to report and assure against, and some don't. Uh, so some are still at a very preliminary stage, um, but, but we do have a process by doing it. But I certainly welcome the discussion. I think it's a, uh, and it is great uh, that the IRF, uh, I, IFRS uh, trustees are stepping up and, and, and encouraging this, this consultation uh, that needs to take place around the world. Please participate. <laughs> I think that we should also encourage the audience to pay attention to what's happening in Europe with some consideration of changing the directive that covers uh, sustainability reporting. I think that there was supposed to be a recommendation out this month. It looks like it's going to be a couple of months off. So paying attention to what's happening in Europe, will they be more specific in what you have to do in sustainability reporting? Will they focus on the assurance side? It's going to be interesting to see what happens in Europe. 
Thank you. Perhaps if I can now ask another question, and many of our webinar participants are researching, auditing and accounting issues in an Indonesian context or are the users of that research. And hence my question is, what advice would you give to anyone who is considering or doing single country analysis type of research, the sort of act locally, think globally? <laughs> Any advice from you, Professor Tarko, um, Professor Street or Professor Simnan? I'll start if I may, Karen. Um, IASB is global. We are interested in single country research and many of the papers that are in the literature reviews I'm talking about are single com country because we understand that researchers within a country have the deepest understanding of their own country and the institutional factors that shape the research. So they are best able to capture those and to make sense of them for the evidence. Um, so we do look at it. Uh, as well as cross-country research, um, then that's the nature of these international organisations setting international standards. Single country work does have a place and I just would encourage researchers to um, make sure they do understand their institutional setting when they're reporting. If they want to work on regional things, get authors from the other countries so you've got a good bank of knowledge. Um, and also, if you're working on a single country or a single region, Make sure you're looking for the thing in that environment that is interesting to the wider world. If, if your country's doing something different with IFRS standards for some reason, investigate that. Find, find things where you have a special insight that others don't have that will help you in the competitive part of the publication process. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, um, Professor Tucker. Would I, I would echo the same views. Uh, I think it's important uh, as researchers to think about who you're trying to influence. Uh, so if you're doing a single country if, uh, research, everybody, there are many, 140 countries plus that, are, that, uh, that take the IASB, 130 countries plus that take the IAASB. Um, we uh, we will always pay attention, but you know it, uh, it's not necessarily going to be a, a result from Indonesia. Is not necessarily going to move the dial on international standard setting, but it's going to be. It could be if it's especially if it's a unique element or if it contributes to the area. So we will listen to it, but certainly look for those unique elements that you can contribute if you're looking to do it. But you're also influencing your local standard setting. You know we want to encourage the best in that country. Uh, so think about your intended audience when you are developing this research and make sure that you are feeding this back into your local jurisdiction because that might be your best intended audience. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Perhaps if I can ask um, Professor Street, um, I, I'm sure the uh, IAAER KPMG research grants as well as other research grants that IAER has facilitated were of um, interest for our audience to learn about. Um, what's, what do you have to do to be able to participate in, in these? And I guess the question is, um, you know, from an IAER, IAAER perspective, you need to be a member, Donna? Yes, uh, the grant programs are open only to members of the organization. And you need to put forward a very, very strong proposal. The program advisory committee is comprised of members of the International Accounting Standards Board, staff of the International Accounting Standards Board, some top-notch researchers. You have to make sure that you have a very, very strong proposal. Thank you. And, and I should point out that um, membership categories of the association include individual faculty members. It can be an accounting school or department, as well as professional associations and professional institutions. I think we have time for maybe three quick questions. So I'm going to um, ask the following. I'm going to ask... Professor Tarka, what advice would you give to anyone who is planning their PhD topic or future research agenda in the area of financial reporting? Thanks, Karen. Well, being a standard setter, I'd say to have a look at the list of work that the standard setters are working on. In particular, 
you look at the research pipeline and the possible future projects because as you work on your PhD for three or four or five years, you want something that is going to be still relevant. So you're looking at future issues, not so much looking into the past. Um, as part of a PhD program, you also do a very thorough literature review which identifies in your area what um, is is the body of knowledge and where the gaps in the knowledge are. So that's always a great way to, to find, as you immerse yourself in, in the existing literature, you find where the openings are. And as you dig into financial reporting work, you find there are many unresolved questions. So that it's a very rich field and there's much you can do. And so um, that'd be my starting point as a financial accounting researcher. Um, but that said, you, you'll find you can then link into where your particular interests lie in terms of the methods you choose and in terms of the, uh, the um, aspect you bring to it. Are you interested in capital markets? Are you interested in investors? You can pick up the, the parts that appeal to you. Thank you. A, a question to Professor Street is um, the last question I'll ask uh, you is given the importance of research to informing standard setting activities, do we as accounting educators pay sufficient attention to research-led, research-informed um, teaching in our curriculum? I would argue that in the United States, we do not. I believe that there is very little focus on accounting research until you get into a graduate program. And I fear that given some changes that might occur in the composition of accounting faculty going forward with the new AACSB standards, that there may be even less focus on research in the curriculum because I suspect that there might be a smaller percentage of accounting faculty who are engaged in research. Thank you. And my last question to Professor um, Simnet, and this was something that you touched on in your slides, well, opportunities often arise from crises. So if I go back to thinking about if you were providing um, some um, advice to um, emerging researchers, what research opportunities arise um, as a result of the fallout of COVID-19 and operating what would be a COVID-19 normal? Thank you for that very simple question, from <laughs> <laughs> Professor Chambers. Um, I think there are uh, uh, research opportunities. I actually think we're entering into a new way of working <clears throat> and we've all had to adjust our way of working. Uh, and uh, the example is today. Uh, we probably would not necessarily have thought about this way of disseminating information. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think there are great research opportunities uh, looking at how we can actually benefit from these particular areas going forward um, as, uh, as well as the impacts on people. Uh, so for auditing, it's been usually in the area of making sure you can get the evidence. And now we've got to think about other ways than getting out to the client and getting access to the accounting systems to get the evidence. You know, use of drones, for example, and all of those areas, as well as the impact on the individuals. Uh, so, you know, we, I have observed some individuals who have thrived under the new environment uh, and work very well individually, uh, and other individuals who have struggled. And we need to understand how we can best support. So, as a profession, uh, we need to to. Uh, it's a great area for research. Uh, again, there are research opportunities there. If it's an area of interest and passion to you, uh, we will see different ways of working. We need to understand the impact of those different ways of working and how best we can inform that process going forward. So great opportunities arise from a crisis. Thank you. I know that was a very complex question, so uh, th thank you. Thank you for answering that. I'd la now like to invite the questions from our participants. I don't know how many have been submitted, and so I will apologise in advance on behalf of each of us if we don't get to um, specifically address the, the array of questions that have come in. 
So uh, what we can see is questions being um, shared on the screen. And what we'll do our best to do is provide succinct answers to as many as we can. So the first one there, should there be an urgent specific case for certain jurisdictions which might not be the case for any other jurisdictions? How is the appetite of the IASB members to, to have this sharing of evidence? So I'll just ask Professor Tarka to answer that. I think it probably picks up on the question that we addressed earlier in terms of the, the single country analysis. But Anne, do you want to reinforce that message? Thanks, Karen. Um, Elvia, I think what you're asking about is when standards are used in a particular country and because of the circumstances in that country, a certain issue emerges. Um, we could use as an example um, the standard for agriculture that the IASB subsequently changed and that came out of a consultation with a number of countries and Malaysia was one of the countries where there was a lot of consultation with the chair of the board and members of the board. So um, you ask about whether the IASB is welcome for the sharing of evidence and I would say that IASB is very welcome and that is why ISB members and staff spend a lot of time consulting and talking to people. Um, so we have links with the Indonesian Accounting Standards Centre, the Malaysian Accounting Centre, with Singapore, with Hong Kong, and so forth through the region. Um, we have a group called AOSSG, which represents the Asia-Oceana region, and many of the standard centres, including India and Nepal and the other countries I've mentioned, Many of the countries are involved in that. And through that forum, we do hear about country-specific things. So we are interested in the evidence. I do think the evidence gets to us through national standard setters. Um, but I would remind you that for all of us to benefit globally, for all of us to benefit globally from one set of standards, we all have to try very hard to use them in a way that's comparable not to insist on using them in our own little jurisdictional way. And, and this is just about for the common good. It's about the capital markets are connected. The investors need the information that they can compare. So it's in everyone's interests to make the standards work in a way that's comparable across countries, not to develop their own versions of IFRS, because that will undermine what, what the global agreement on what we we're trying to achieve. So thank you for your question. Thank you, Professor Tucker. And I think that also leads into the second question, which um, has partly been addressed. That perhaps um, it, it, it's associated with the comparability of financial reporting among Asia-Pacific countries. How's that been achieved? And if there's been a reduction in the cost of capital, sort of that's the empirical analysis that occurs. But you just mentioned, Professor Tucker, the sort of Oceana standard setting group. Do you want to elaborate on that group and its role and... and and um, what yes. what it what it contributes to? Um, absolutely. So the Asia Oceana um, Standard Setting Group (AOSSG) uh, is an affiliation of national standard setters from the Asia Oceana region. And of course, we are the biggest region, and we've got so many important countries in our region. And uh, it's so important for countries to get together and discuss. Because on the one hand, we're all worried about uh, our own country and our own uh, economies and businesses and employment, um, yet we're all connected. And this year has shown us just how we are connected. So something like the AOSSG group brings together the standard setters. And the, stand the national standard setters are such an important voice um, Karen, in terms of uh, speaking to the IASB, because the IASB, of course, is a very actually a very small organisation. Um, so it, it's the people on the ground that that are in constant contact with their various stakeholders, and and they can collect information and disseminate it. And so the, a group like this one we're talking about is a place where the standard setters can talk to each other. And then they can also talk to the IASB. So at that meeting, the standard setters bring papers and talk to us about issues that are on the agenda for the IASB that, and how they're playing out in various countries and how we can come together and address them. So in the same way, we all learn from each other by talking to each other. That, that's what's happening at the standard setting level where countries speak and they work out how to get to solutions 
for um, application of the standard. Thank you. The third question on that on the first slide here is: To what extent does the IASB seek the development of industrial technology? 4.0 affecting future accounting practices. Um, perhaps if we don't direct this initially to Professor Tucker in the first instance, but um, you know, just to, to start with a blanket statement that certainly the development of uh, technologies is affecting accounting practices. And we've seen that and we talked about it in the webinar last week in terms of the revision of international accounting education standards and the um, revisions that occurred through the lens of um, emerging ICT areas. But it was something that Professor Simnet picked up in his presentation. So perhaps, um, you know, if we think about how it's impacting practice and the auditing um, practices particularly, would you like to provide any elaboration, Professor Simnett? Uh, thanks, Professor Chalmers, and thank you very much uh, for the question. It's a, it's a question that we get quite considerably, and there are uh, mixed views. What we need to do is ensure that the standards, the international standards, uh, uh, are actually uh, safe, safe proof going forward uh, so that they do cater for changes in technology that we see either in the accounting practices or in the auditing practices. So it's a continual uh, a continual challenge to us uh, to be on top and understand these practices uh, and to ensure that the standards are not standing in the way of good innovation uh, and, and the standards are reflective of those areas. Uh, again, our process is very principles-based uh, and, and uh, Professor Tarka can talk from the IASB about the fact that they look at specific areas, uh, but uh, our standards are very principles based, and our and uh, so we we do have a high level where we believe and we review this consistently uh, to make sure that these changes that we are seeing in the in regard uh, in industrial technology are, uh, are not impacting. We are finding we are having to put out quite a lot of guidance for auditors uh, in the area as to how they either deal with. In the accounting area, or they or they use in the auditing area these new technologies, and there is that is one of the things that's on our agenda, and you will see a lot coming out in the next year in this particular area. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Street. The second question: there, Does the development of accounting proceed or follow the economic development of a country? And I direct that question to you because I know this has been an area of um, great interest to IFAC and that yes. IAAR was involved in um, some work around this. I actually had this in my presentation and took it out in the interest of time, so I wish I had a slide on this. Uh, this is an area where donors and some professional accountancy organizations believe that you need a strong accountancy profession and then economic development will follow. But there is very little research in this area and the findings are inconsistent. We have a paper in the Institutional Perspectives section of GIFMA that Elizabeth Gordon, Elmar Vintar and I developed based on a series of roundtables sponsored by IAAER, the International Federation of Accountants, and one of their donors, DFID. I would encourage you to look at that because there is a question that I can't answer because we really don't know what the answer is. We, in that particular paper, set forth a number of research questions, and we encourage academic researchers to um, to, commu to communicate on that. Karen, if you would like for me to, what I could do is I could add the citation to that particular paper to my slides and pass them on to you so you could share them with the audience for those that might have an interest in this topic. Certainly. Thank you. Um, the first question on that slide, uh, uh, Professor Simna, do you want to comment on that or it, it's... Very, very quickly, <laughs> Professor Jarman. Uh Look, uh, it's, a, it's a very specific question. Uh, what you would encourage, of course, is that this information should be disclosed in the accounting report first. Uh, you shouldn't have new information disclosed in the audit report. So the audit, uh, the audit report will 
uh, uh, wheel is actually uh, to add credibility to the accounting information. So you would encourage disclosure of this, whatever this organisation is, as to where they are at, at this particular process of deregistration. You want me to have a go to the last have question too? Oh, certainly. I was about to say we have touched on the uh, discussion around impact and um, global versus local, but um, certainly let's reinforce that message. Yes, and I you know, and again, it, it, it's a great question. So thank you very much for the question. Uh, and how do we identify the issues uh, that uh, that we should be paying most attention to, and how do we deal with them? Uh, and, and it's a matter of being able to hear from everybody and, and looking at the evidence. So uh, as you, uh, as, as most of the uh, participants would know, uh, climate change is very heavily on the agenda. Uh, and not everybody necessarily agrees with the science, but we need to listen to the research, the science research in those particular areas, same as health pandemics. Uh, we listen to the science research. And if it's a global issue, uh, then we try and deal with it globally. Uh, so our best approach to try and address some of these issues, and we've been successful in the past and we can be successful again uh, as long as we come together. That might mean a, 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 a top-down approach from the global, always supported by a bottom-up approach by what's being done in the individual countries. But uh, we need to uh, listen to uh, countries as to what they see as the important things uh, and get the research right and then best look at how best to address it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I can see one here, the second one, which is a question to Professor Simnert and Professor Taka. How do standard setters assess the importance of areas of interest? Do you address them all? I guess this question gets to how do you formulate your or how do you prioritise your areas and develop your sort of plan um, for the next three years? And I'll, I'll start because we've yes, maybe Roger. lost a picture of Professor Tarkin, but she might come. Oh, she, she's okay. about to come on. Do well, you want to go first, Dan? Thanks, Roger. Um, this is a very timely question for us because we are going into an agenda consultation. So we'll be um, releasing documents next year asking you to comment on what the IASB should work on. So we call that an agenda consultation. We go through that process every five years and we're expecting um, lots of comments from you, from our stakeholders, about the priorities of our work. One of our previous questions today was about the technology and technological change and whether accounting standards cope with that. So we'd be expecting lots of people to say, we think you should focus on intangible assets, for example, just as an example, or they may indeed refer to the sustainability issues. We know from investors that they're very unhappy with IFRS 8. Um, Donna talked about segment reporting. There are other investors who are really unhappy about IAS 7, cash flow segments. Those two are old things. They're not new things, but people are still unhappy about them. So um, we get feedback to work out on what are the priorities for stakeholders, and that's how we work out what to work on. Over to you, Roger. Uh, thanks, thanks, Anne. Uh, and we go through a similar process. Uh, as I presented on the slides, the IASB 2015 to 2019, 2020 to 2023. So we've set a work program and work agenda after extensive consultation and listening to everybody. Uh, and again, at the national level, the national standard setters will do exactly the same thing. So it's important to see what your national standard setter is doing participate in that consultation because we have to look, hear from everybody uh, in those areas because it's on that way that we actually build our, our, our work program going forward to address what we believe are the areas of interest. Uh, we don't address them all because there's always more areas of interest, uh, but we have to prioritise what we see, hear the, hear, the, hear the views, prioritise what we see into a manageable work program given the resources that we have. Thank you. We have a question here that talks about the challenge of getting preparers or auditors to participate in research. 
And I'll address this one to Professor Simnett. Given um, <laughs> Professor Simnett spoke about the uh, work that had been undertaken on analysing the trends in auditing assurance research and, and the referencing of audit and assurance standards in archival versus um, behavioural research. So any tips um, in terms of trying to get that engagement to add that, I guess, element of realism to the, the research. Professor Simnett. Uh, thanks, Professor Chalmers. And uh, again, thank you very much uh, for a great question. Uh, one, to, as I outlined, this is behavioural research, uh, so getting access to, to people who can do it. And for, and for auditing, it is effectively auditing behaviour. Uh, it is auditors that is the principal group uh, in that particular area. Uh, it's hard, uh, and we can see the trend is it's even getting harder. Uh, so all I could do is what you have to do is you have to build up relationships. It's no good just going to uh, a group of auditors and asking if you can re run a behavioural experiment or run a survey. You build up a relationship uh, with that firm. So it's important that you do that. You make sure that they're, they're, your research is of interest to them. So how best do you motivate your research uh, in those particular areas? I would certainly encourage you to do that. Uh, for auditing, uh, if you can get access to real auditors making real auditing decisions, uh, that will bring a realism. Sometimes students could be a good surrogate for certain types of decisions. So think carefully about what the decision-making is you're looking at, but certainly work build up the relationship, be able to motivate and sell your research uh, to, to the people who you would like. Don't just expect them to participate. Thank you. The, the, and it may have come out in the, the, piece of, um, the piece of audio that I missed, but Professor Simner, is there a role for sort of local professional associations here too in terms of access to participants? Thank you very much. And uh, again, Professor Chalmers, uh, a big role for the local uh, pro professions. Again, uh, to coordinate, look at what your local profession is doing, uh, what the activities are, uh, participate in those activities and feed into those particular processes. Um, it's the best way to influence. A lot of the cases, uh, you know, we start looking at how we can best influence. And as, as Professor Tarka said, your local organisations will feed into either through IFAC membership uh, or will feed through national standard setters at the accounting or auditing level, so that the global here. So it's that ground up approach that, that works well. So build up those relationships. It is very, we are a very applied discipline, accounting and auditing. Uh, you need to build up those relationships and work hard at those at building those particular relationships. Thank you. There's a question on the slide that talks about disclosures. Perhaps, Professor Tarka, would you like to just reiterate the, the work that's occurring in relation to disclosures and sort of the, the checklist type of disclosure versus um, a more overarching uh, disclosure strategy? Thanks. Uh, so existing research um, will often look at disclosure requirements in an accounting standard and endeavour to determine if those disclosure requirements have been met. So it might be disclosure-based research or might be compliance-based research, and Donna has done some of this. Excuse me. <clears throat> but in recent years, people have complained that there's too many words and not enough information. So too many irrelevant words and not enough useful information. So the ISB has been working on various projects and what I mentioned in my slide deck was the Disclosure Initiative Project. So you can find that on the website, you can find the details. The idea behind this project is that if people are given objectives, they can then decide what information to provide to meet those objectives. So more disclosure objectives less disclosure checklists. Now, this is quite controversial. Not everybody thinks it will work. Some people are great supporters. Other people are sceptics. So that means a great opportunity for the researchers to have a look. On the one hand, it might be having a look at the standards, as I outlined. But on the other hand, it might be talking to practitioners, that is, preparers or auditors or investors. So I can only circle back to... Professor Simnett's comments today 
about getting connected with local organisations, doing something for them, and then that you're in a better position for them to do something for you, which is making themselves available for your research. So it's a very important role that you can play because it's not all about just what we read in the financial statements. It's a lot about finding about the behaviours that have gone behind. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very aware of the time and I apologise if we haven't got to address all of the questions that may have been submitted. <coughs> We're very happy to receive a, a, a list of these questions and we think um, it hasn't been addressed to, to provide um, a response to you. So I would like to thank my colleagues, Professor Tarka, Professor Street and Professor Simnet for their insightful presentations, the perspectives that they were able to bring to the discussion and their willingness to um, engage in this webinar. So thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity um, that you have provided to allow all of us to um, engage with you as an audience. So I will now hand back to the organisers. Perkenankan saya menyapa semua partisipan yang hadir pagi ini dan mengucapkan terima kasih setia sampai pada sesi kedua ini uh, mencapai lebih dari 800 partisipan. Nah, uh, giliran saya untuk membawakan uh, sesi dua ini uh, bersama ketiga pembicara yang sangat prominent hari ini. Perkenankan saya share. Um, Four point untuk uh, sesi kedua uh, sesi kedua ini uh, sebelum kita uh, memulai uh, diskusi pada sesi kedua kali ini perkenankan saya menyampaikan CV singkat ketiga pembicara yang sangat prominent kita hari ini sekaligus rekan uh, kami di DSAK beliau bertiga memiliki background Akademisi Bu Elvia dari Universitas Indonesia, Bu Ersa dari Universitas Pajajaran, dan Bu Devi Kalanjati dari Universitas Erlangga. Bu Elvia, uh, beliau selain mengajar di Universitas Indonesia, juga mengajar di University South Australia. Pengalaman beliau 22 tahun di industri perbankan sebelum akhirnya menekuni dunia akademik. Beliau berhasil mempublikasikan di top rank jurnal di wilayah accounting and environmental journal. Beliau juga sangat aktif dalam uh, melakukan penelitian termasuk juga dalam hal uh, memberikan uh, perannya di dalam DSAK melalui uh, pemikiran yang tentu saja latar belakang akademik sebagai riset sangat kemudian menginspirasi dalam proses penyusunan standar. Selanjutnya Bu Ersa dari Pas Pajar uh, memiliki gelar keprofesian juga si CPMA, si CPPSAK, si si CE. Beliau juga aktif meneliti termasuk menulis buku catatan yang saya miliki di sini memperlihatkan Bu Ersa selalu outstanding di dalam hal edukasi menjadi lulusan terbaik saat uh, di program S1 PPAK S2 dia berusaha peroleh dari University of Melbourne kemudian dilanjutkan S3 diperoleh dari University of Manchester uh, BSP Award diperoleh oleh Bu Elf dalam berbagai conference <laughs> juga beliau tidak lupa saya aktif di DSAK beliau juga menjikan atau memberikan berbagai konsultasi akuntansi dan keuangan yang sudah pengalaman lebih dari uh, 10 tahun. Bu Devi selanjutnya dari uh, Universitas Kepangga menyelesaikan dua master di luar negeri, satu dari University of Melbourne, yang satu dari University of High School Netherlands. Uh, beliau selesai doktor di 2019 dan memiliki karya uh, di top uh, journal as strategy of, of accounting. Uh, sekaligus lupa ya harus saya sebutkan kenyataan juga Bu Elvia memiliki pengalaman di uh, kantor akuntan Belok. Tanpa mempermajang waktu uh, untuk memperkenalkan beliau tiga, saya
saya berikan kesempatan yang kepada Bu Eldia untuk menyajikan uh, slide berapa slide sebelum nanti dilanjutkan oleh Bu uh, Elsa, Bu Dev dan lanjutkan dalam sesi diskusi yang saya akan ampu kemudian dilanjutkan yang terakhir di diskusi dari partisipan Bu Elvia, waktu kami serahkan sepenuhnya ke Bu Elvia dengan tayangan saya pandu melalui uh, komputer saya silakan Bu Elvia uh, Selamat Selamat pagi uh, Bapak dan Ibu semuanya Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Salam sejahtera untuk semuanya. Terima kasih. Nanti saya hanya share tiga slide saja karena sifatnya lebih ke provokasi ini Pak Singgi. Jadi nanti e, menyemangati e, kayak ngipasin sate Pak supaya satenya panas, bakarannya panas. Nah nanti kemudian ada beberapa e, paper yang e, akan muncul insya Allah dari sini. Nah e, jadi mohon slide berikutnya Pak Singgi. Baik. Uh, ini slide saya yang kedua setelah slide judul tadi. Jadi kalau uh, N, N tadi sudah bicara panjang lebar, Dona juga sudah bicara panjang lebar tentang proyek-proyeknya. Uh, kalau saya ingin meneliti tentang um, um, financial counting dan financial reporting ini, dan tentu saja tentang uh, development daripada IFRS, dari mana saya mulai? Biasanya kita selalu... Uh, apa namanya bikin soal ujian atau bikin soal untuk assignment untuk 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 kelas kita itu saya mulainya dari uh, linknya yang ada di ISB yaitu dengan title yaitu uh, ISB Work Plan di sana itu selalu ada update daftar penelitian penelitian atau daftar perkembangan perkembangan daripada FRS yang sedang di uh, didiskusikan oleh uh, map standard setters uh, di uh, ISB nah Tadi N sudah-sudah juga mendaftar beberapa list daripada proyek yang sangat menarik sekali, yang mungkin jadi appetite uh, kita semuanya. Tadi saya tanyakan tadi, soalnya kenapa saya nanyakan pertanyaan kepada uh, tiga panelis tadi, uh, masalahnya adalah karena kadang-kadang saya pikir who cares about Indonesia, itu, itu, itu yang utama sekali, who cares about Indonesia, dan saya pikir apakah memang, uh, apa namanya, penelitian atau evidence kita ini bisa kita share kepada yang lain. Saya ambil contoh, minggu lalu kita ada diskusi tentang uh, tentang apa itu, tentang hak atas tanah ya. Minggu lalu kita uh, diskusi di sana. Hak atas tanah yang kita tahu ini sangat spesifik sekali dan ini hanya uh, mungkin berlaku buat kasus Indonesia itu ya. Jadi, Uh, karena kita punya sistem yang berbeda dari negara lainnya, kita nggak mengadop tentang uh, anglo Saxons dalam urusan atas tanah ini. Nah, kalau ini kita tidak berisik gitu ya, kita tidak noisy uh, to make impactful research gitu ya, kadang-kadang uh, apa yang diatur oleh uh, ISB mungkin tidak menguntungkan bagi dunia investasi di negeri kita. Nah, itu itu tuh salah satu contoh saja. Kenapa uh, tadi saya tanyakan ke da, ke, kepada panelis dari uh, yang dari luar negeri uh, bahwa memang who cares about Indonesia itu it's very very important. Kita sudah dapat assurance tadi bahwa mereka uh, melakukan case by case. Uh, tentu saja di, uh, tergantung dari importance importance atau kepentingan daripada masing-masing jurisdiksi. Jadi bapak ibu saya uh, tugas di sini adalah sebagai provokator. Tentu saja. Uh, penting sekali untuk kita cermati bahwa studi apapun yang studi apapun yang itu uh, berkaitan dengan uh, kita bisa sharing kepada uh, jurisdiksi yang lain sangat penting untuk kita bagikan kepada yang lain selama sama uh, tadi ya saya katakan who cares dan yang paling penting adalah bahwa itu memang bisa di uh, jadi ja, di, jadi acuan jadi panutan atau jadi mungkin uh, apa uh, men, membuat Polisi mereka juga jadi uh, jadi berubah dan lain sebagainya terhadap masukan yang kita berikan. Jadi yang tidak diingini oleh ISB itu adalah bahwa itu hanya untuk kasus kita saja yang tidak dapat mungkin uh, diaplikasikan pada yurisdiksi yang lain. Nah itu penting sekali buat kita lakukan. Saya rasa tentang hak atas tanah mungkin kita nggak pernah, pernah mikir bahwa HGB dan HPL itu hanya untuk kasus Indonesia saja. Mungkin saja ini terjadi di negara di Brasil sana atau di Ekuador atau di mana negara-negara lainnya. 
Nah itu yang penting sekali buat kita melakukan impactful research tadi. So who cares dan yang paling penting itu dapat diaplikasikan. Why are the parts of the world ada bagian lain di dunia sana yang mau dengerin dan mau membaca pada paper kita. Itu kan inti daripada kenapa kita paper kita itu local wisdom bisa kita jual apa enggak. Nah, itu yang pertama. Nah kedua. Yang kita harus tahu dengan baik, yang kita harus uh, cermati dengan baik adalah bahwa Yang kita juga harus cermati dengan baik adalah bahwa Driver untuk melakukan penelitian tadi ya Itu tadi saya katakan kalau saya mulainya dari IASB World Plan Tapi seringkali kita sendiri sebagai apa, practitioners atau sebagai academicians Sering di kelas itu dapat pertanyaan dari mahasiswa Bu kalau kayak gini gimana? Uh, Bu, kalau kayak gini gimana? Kebetulan misalnya saya punya kelas itu khusus kelas BPK, karyawan BPK ya, satu kelas kelas malam itu. Kelas BPK ada di provinsi, di provinsi Sulawesi Barat gitu ya. Very unique, very unique kelas gitu. Seringkali kita, uh, nggak kepikiran juga ya, kasus seperti ini terjadi gitu lah. Nah, jadi drivernya itu bisa macam-macam. Bisa dari ISP World Plan, bisa dari business practices kita, bisa dari kelas kita kalau kita pengajar. Bisa juga karena mungkin diskusi dan juga mungkin pengalaman dan mungkin ada ada perusahaan yang menanyakan kepada kita, Bu, kalau seperti ini apa yang terjadi? Nah, Bapak dan Ibu, beberapa waktu lalu, uh, kita sudah mulai melakukan survei. tentang uh, revisiting asumsi daripada kelangsungan usaha atau going concern, oke? Okay? Uh, proyek itu sama sekali tidak diinisiasi dari link atau uh, uh, update yang dilakukan oleh ISB Work Plan. Itu inisiasi murni dari kita, dari pengalaman kita, bahwa kita melihat dampak daripada COVID ini, kalau kita teruskan dengan asumsi, kita punya asumsi seperti ini, bahwa kalau kita teruskan dengan asumsi daripada uh, kelangsungan usaha sesuai yang diatur di dalam KKPK, kok ada yang kurang serg ya menurut kita nih. Nah, tapi kita mungkin aja bias, kita mungkin aja kita uh, apa namanya uh, uh, salah info atau mungkin kita sampel kita, situasi kita yang membuat kita mengambil kesimpulan seperti itu. Nah, oleh karena itu kita sebarkan uh, kemarin kuesioner. Bapak dan Ibu ingat bahwa itu drivernya bukan dari ISP Workland. Drivernya bukan dari ASOK, tadi seperti yang disebutkan oleh CN, tapi kita akan bawa nanti presentasi kepada ASOK mengenai revisiting assumptions on going concerns. Nah, ini penting sekali bagi Bapak dan Ibu yang akan melakukan penelitian. Sekarang pertanyaannya adalah, atau yang akan mempublikasikan penelitian mereka ke dalam jurnal, pertanyaan adalah, how impactful is your research? Bagaimana nah, seberapa besar impact penelitian Anda, kalau Anda mau targetin itu adalah untuk jurnal internasional, I think most of us will target international journal, tentu saja impact-nya, gaungnya juga jauh, harus lebih besar. Jadi tadi saya katakan, apa uniqueness-nya, apa kepentingannya buat negara lain, why do they bother, mengapa mereka harus bother untuk baca uh, paper kita, gitu loh. Kenapa sih kok paper kita itu pasti harus dibaca di uh, mereka yang ada di Netherlands sana misalnya, atau di Bel- Belgia sana. Nah itu yang paling penting sekali, itu yang paling saya katakan. Jadi kalau going concerns kita mau, mau share kepada audience di belahan dunia yang mana, kita mau kasih tahu Indonesia itu agak spesifik loh. Dampak daripada krisis ini sangat-sangat-sangat spesifik sekali. Misalnya saya ada pertanyaan dari Pak Febrianto Lim ini ya, Uh, misalnya dampak daripada COVID-19 yang sangat sangat apa namanya sangat dahsyat sekali buat uh, negara lain, utamanya juga buat negara kita. Nah, apa betul bahwa apa betul bahwa konsep daripada asumsi daripada wing concerns itu perlu kita revisit itu yang 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 uh, jadi uh, uh, tujuan kita. Misalnya salah satunya di, demikian. Apa betul di SAKIAI harus mulai atau seyogianya mulai melakukan diskusi tentang revisiting asumsi tentang kelangsungan usaha tadi. Apakah betul bahwa kini saatnya anggota di SAKIAI untuk dapat nah, diskusi melakukan apa namanya uh, menambahkan klausul tentang uh, ketentuan mengenai pengakuan, uh, pengukuran, measurements dan juga mungkin penyajiannya, presentations daripada Uh, asumsi going concerns ini karena kita kebetulan dapat dampak yang lebih besar lebih besar relatively uh, lebih signifikan dibandingkan negara yang lain. Nah, kalau itu terjadi alangkah baiknya ini jadi masukan 
untuk standar setters juga untuk ke uh, uh, di DSK level DSK IAI dan juga level kepada uh, ISP sana. Nah ini uh, ini salah satu yang saya mau katakan. Jadi drivernya kalau bapak dan ibu lihat slides yang ada di di dalam uh, sini bisa saja dari request for information, bisa saja dari maintenance project, research project, discussion paper dan lain sebagainya. Saya sering ditanya di kelas, apa kita bisa mulai dari yang DE saja, Bu? Karena kan DE akan keluar menjadi akan menjadi keluar menjadi standar. Betul, itu biasanya ada tenggang waktu yang cukup untuk kita melakukan penelitian sebelum uh, apa namanya? sebelum keluar menjadi uh, sebuah standar. Nah, tapi tidak harus, not necessarily. Kita bisa juga mulai dari yang namanya request for information. Nah, kita bisa mulai dari mana saja, tidak harus dari mulai dari uh, uh, misalnya dari DE. Kita bisa saja mulai dari standar yang baru saja diterapkan misalnya, ya. Nah, standar yang sudah diterapkan itu kadang-kadang kita kan waktu kita kita lihat dampaknya terhadap bisnis ternyata Oh, kok jadi tadi ada pertanyaan juga mengenai economic development tadi. Apa betul ini akan menjadi uh, memperbaiki uh, peng, uh, pe pembangunan ekonomi di suatu negara? Once the standard is already established, once the standard already set up, itu kita mau lihat pengaruhnya terhadap uh, dunia uh, ekonomi secara keseluruhan. Jadi saya cuma ada beberapa uh, apa namanya slash yang saya katakan di sini ini bisa jadi macam-macam dan mungkin saja menjadi trigger. Poin saya Bapak dan Ibu not necessarily comes from ED tapi bisa juga start dari standards yang sudah established tapi kita mau memberikan masukan terhadapnya dan kemudian juga kita bisa mulai dari awal sekali dari yang dini sekali yaitu tentang request for information. Nah Utamanya, utamanya yang kalau Bapak dan Ibu lihat bahwa waktu kita memberikan uh, apa namanya masukan ini, ya, yang memberikan masukan kepada standar setters itu, kita harus tahu uh, tentunya channel atau uh, media yang akan kita gunakan sebaik-baiknya sehingga kita noise kita itu uh, terdengar, terdengar oleh mereka, ya, terdengar oleh mereka. Nah, kalau kita uh, bergerak ke Slide berikutnya Pak Singgi. Tadi uh, di slide sebelumnya saya bicara tentang, saya ambil salah satu topik saja. Seringkali uh, mahasiswa saya entah di uh, kelas S2 atau kelas S3 datang pada saya ya. Bu, kalau saya bikin seperti ini bagaimana ya uh, tesis atau uh, disertasi saya. Jadi at the end kamu mau bilang apa? Anda mau bilang apa? Well, at the end saya akan katakan bahwa perusahaan ini telah menerapkan standar dengan baik. At the end saya akan katakan bahwa standar tersebut mengalami kendala di sana di sini di sana sini. Uh, kita bicara tentang impactful research itu uh, kalau kita cuma katakan at the end result yang mengatakan bahwa dia uh, perusahaan ini melakukan sesuai standar atau bukan atau at the end kita mengatakan bahwa ada kendala sedikit di sana sini um, itu yang saya katakan impactful researchnya mungkin at the minimum level jadi kalau kita bicara kapan paper kita bisa masuk ke dalam uh, jurnal yang sangat ber apa namanya bereputasi dan punya impactful research yang besar. Once it has to be very very unique, ya findingnya itu harus very very unique. Don't just talk about uh, it is in line with the standards or it is not in line with the standards or there are some improvement here and there. Tapi uniknya itu dalam artian apa? Dampak secara ekonomi keseluruhan itu besar sekali. Dampak kepada investor yang dirasakan oleh investor itu besar sekali. Dampak bagi si Uh, pengambil keputusan OJK misalnya dampak bagi standard setters dampak bagi uh, preparers mereka akhirnya wih, akhirnya ada yang juga yang berisik yang ngomongin on behalf of kita gitu ya nah itu uh, tentu saja representasi daripada studi kita unit analisa kita itu harus uh, very very powerful not not in terms of size tapi representations representasi daripada sampel yang akan kita ambil tadi ya. Jadi ini eh, yang yang penting sekali. Misalnya kalau kita lihat uh, invitations untuk melakukan penelitian atas goodwill ya, uh, discussions paper and comment uh, on business combinations dan juga disclosures goodwill and impairment. Itu 
sekarang ini lagi ada undangan pada kita ya ada undangan pada kita uh, kita sudah pindah dari uh, annual uh, amortization ke impairment ternyata dalam prakteknya impairment itu costly very very costly dan ternyata dalam prakteknya tidak mencapai target yang apa adanya ya. ternyata di dalam bisnis acquisitions ya itu uh, banyak sekali masalah misalnya uh, ternyata di trigger oleh lebih kepada agency motif dibandingkan dengan misalnya sinergi motif paper saya yang menjual mengenai bisnis combinations perbandingan antara uh, sinergi motif dan uh, agency motif bisa laku masuk ke Q2 karena apa karena saya betul-betul kita uh, satu tim ya ini uh, tim dengan uh, staf pengajar FEBUI, mengatakan bahwa memang ternyata tergantung, sangat tergantung dari motivasi daripada si perusahaan yang melakukan merger and acquisition tersebut. Nah, Bapak Ibu, di slide saya, saya sudah katakan, selain Yuni, uh, sering kali, Bu, tapi kalau menungguin annual report, kok ya lama banget ya, Bu, ya. Misalnya kayak sekarang, kita mau melihat dampak covid Terus dampak COVID kan harus nunggu annual report. Annual report mungkin masih uh, Maret uh, tahun depan. Uh, paling cepat Maret tahun depan. Well, kenapa kita harus melihat dari segi kuantitatif data? Bapak dan Ibu mungkin pernah dengar yang namanya snippet. Snippet ya. Uh, itu adalah satu teknik yang luar biasa banget ya. Itu snippet itu kualitatif uh, tadi. Kebetulan karena saya uh, not purely kuantitatif. Tapi saya melakukan penelitian itu lebih kepada mix method, mix method dari segi pengukuran. Jadi yang saya lihat adalah rich, uh, rich text based data, kualitatif. Saya lihat, kemudian saya gunakan teknik yang namanya adalah teknik snippets tadi. Apa itu snippets? Ini kemarin saya habis. Oke, okay. uh, uh, baik. Uh, saya kira uh, Bu Elvia, mungkin Bu, Bu Elsa mohon mencoba apakah memiliki isu yang sama untuk menyampaikan sembari Um, Halo. Ya, Bu, saya mohon ya sedikit ada kendala dengan suara. Uh, uh, nanti kita bisa lanjutkan pada sesi tanya jawab Bu Elvia. Uh, semoga serisop untuk masalah uh, suara kami tidak bisa mendengar. Mungkin uh, bisa dicoba in and out. Bu, Bu Ersa, uh, silakan Bu Ersa sama dengan Bu Elvia 10 sampai maksimal 15 menit untuk menyampaikan slide uh, selanjutnya. Monggo Bu Ersa. Baik, terima kasih Pak Singgi, Bapak Ibu. Ini luar biasa nih participants-nya masih on terus ya. Dan saya mengucapkan apresiasi sebesar-besarnya pada Universitas Gajah Mada, pada Pak Singgi terutama nih yang sudah mengorganisir, membuat this thing happens. Ini sebenarnya impian saya nih Pak bahwa kita punya forum seperti ini di mana kita bisa berdiskusi ya dan mengumpulkan semua dosen akademisi yang punya concern ke standar setting uh, sama dengan Bu Elvia saya juga hanya punya dua slide ini uh, kalau menurut saya Pak sebagai Dewan Standar ya di Indonesia uh, kita seperti tadi Roger Sinet dan para panelis bilang kita harus membuat uh, keputusan itu berdasarkan evidence base gitu ya jangan bikin keputusan itu meremang-remang apa dalam gelap kita tidak tahu impact dan lain sebagainya jadi uh, tentunya sebagai anggota DSAK Pak Singgi, Bu Elvia, Bu Devi pasti setuju juga bahwa kita itu ingin mengambil keputusan uh, se sebelum mengambil keputusan itu kita ingin sebenarnya punya misalnya field testing begitu ya saya sering melihat uh, misalnya field testing itu yang sering dilakukan oleh Eropa EFREC, EFREC itu sering melakukan field testing sehingga misalnya sebelum menerapkan PSAK 73 IFRS 16, setahun sebelum IFRS 16 berlaku, dia sudah tahu tuh bahwa nanti kalau IFRS 16 berlaku akan meningkatkan total liabilitas di Eropa sebesar 800 sekian juta bilion euro gitu. Jadi udah ketahuan impact-nya. Nah itu yang uh, di kita ini rada susah ya untuk melakukan field testing sebelumnya. Nah uh, itu yang menurut saya uh, dibutuhkan. Kita perlu riset-riset data historis juga yang selama ini sering dilakukan oleh teman-teman dan oleh kita menggunakan data historis laporan keuangan dan lain sebagainya, tetapi kadang-kadang yang dibutuhkan oleh Dewan Standar itu forward looking gitu kan, standarnya belum belum berlaku, kita pengen tahu dampaknya seperti apa, kalau standarnya itu nanti akan berlaku, seperti tadi yang field testing itu penting sekali dilakukan oleh IASB untuk setiap standarnya. Nah, kenapa forward looking itu penting? Karena di Indonesia itu kita rada terlambat Pak dalam menerapkan standar. Ini ada grafik di sebelah kanan. Salah satu riset saya yang 
dimuat di JSSH ya e, pertanika itu ini contoh saja ini simpel aja contohnya ini khusus PSK 7 related party kita melihat disclosure Uh, yang warna kuning itu kalau disclosure-nya komplit itu disclosure-nya kita kasih skor 4 skor 4 itu berarti dia ada semua tuh lengkap semua ya dan PSK 7 itu berlakunya itu 2011 pertama kita adopsi Bapak Ibu bisa lihat tahun 2011 yang warna kuning itu sedikit tuh ini annual report ya 31 Desember 2011 31 Desember 2012 dan seterusnya padahal PSK 7 itu sudah berlaku dari 1 Januari 2011 tapi itu butuh waktu gitu orang Indonesia tuh untuk mengadopsi standar. Ya seharusnya kan kita pikirannya kalau sudah dari 1 Januari paling nggak Q2 lah. Q2 2011 harusnya sudah mulai, harusnya Desember 2011 harusnya sudah komplit gitu ya. Tapi ber berkali-kali saya me meneliti masalah disclosure ini, itu susah gitu untuk melihat keterterapan standar di, di uh, interim report. Yang kemudian di annual report aja tahun pertama kadang-kadang belum kelihatan. Baru di tahun kedua, tahun ketiga baru kelihatan. Sehingga kadang-kadang uh, tidak match antara uh, uh, riset yang ada dengan kebutuhan Dewan Standar. Ya. Jadi yang pertama kita perlu banyak sekali uh, forward looking atau uh, impact study atau field testing dari standar-standar yang akan berlaku. Misalnya standar akuntansi keuangan entitas privat yang ekspos sudah, sudah keluar. Bagaimana sih field testing BPR kalau pakai SAK privat ini bagaimana? Atau entitas yang tadinya pakai etap, kemudian pakai sakep, ya kita bilangnya SAK, entitas privat sakep, itu bagaimana dap, itunya? Apa namanya uh, bedanya gitu ya? Kemudian SAK 74 yang masih eksposur draft, itu dampaknya gimana terhadap industri perbankan? Nah, yang forward looking forward looking ini yang uh, kita sangat akan sangat mendukung keputusan uh, Dewan Standar. Kemudian yang kedua juga harus mempertimbangkan beragam pandangan pemangku kepentingan. Bukan hanya uh, bukan hanya investor yang diperlukan ya uh, interestnya, tapi juga preparers ya, auditor, konsultannya uh, itu juga perlu uh, kita pertimbangkan ya. Dan uh, yang ketiga ini yang susah juga ya mengapa dan bagaimana pilihan-pilihan akuntansi dibuat oleh manajemen puncak. Saya melihat uh, uh, cukup sulit kita untuk ini pengalaman pribadi juga ya. Cukup sulit kalau kita ingin melakukan interview ke CFO misalnya ya, top-top manajemen atau ke partner-partner uh, audit gitu, uh, untuk me bertanya kepada mereka bagaimana keputusan dibuat. ya. Jadi misalnya begini, yang paling gampang, yang paling banyak riset itu terjadi kan, uh, banyak riset itu kuantitatif uh, tentang faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi keputusan perusahaan memilih fair value untuk properti investasi atau untuk biological aset. Ya, itu sering tuh kuantitatif tadi. Jadi ada dummy variable untuk Y, dia pilih fair value atau pilih historical cost kalau I1 fair value, kalau historical cost, cost 0, kemudian uh, independent variable-nya beragam lah, ada size, ada industri segala macam. Nah, saya juga pernah melakukan hal tersebut, riset gitu kan, faktor-faktor apa. Tapi kemudian ditambah juga dengan interview ke para top manajemen investment property yang punya investment property. Kenapa sih mereka itu lebih banyak pilih historical cost? Ternyata alasannya, ternyata mereka tuh males pilih fair value karena males berhubungan sama orang pajak. Kalau pakai fair value kecenderungannya, Bu, kita suka di, apa diperiksa sama orang pajak. Males, ah, Bu, gitu. Jadi faktor convenient, faktor pajak itu besar. Dan itu tidak akan tertangkap kalau kita hanya misalnya pakai kuantitatif uh, study pakai uh, laporan keuangan aja gitu misalnya ya. Nah itu yang uh, kita perlu tahu kenapa bagaimana sih decision making itu dibuat, bagaimana sih uh, accounting policy itu dibuat. Karena uh, akuntansi itu keputusannya dibuat oleh manusia bukan oleh mesin gitu kan. Uh, bagaimana audit audit fee misalnya banyak riset tentang audit fee uh, faktor-faktor mempengaruhi audit fee gitu ya. Tanya aja gitu kepada partner audit kalau saya mah. Bagaimana sih Bapak um, me, me, me set audit fee? Mungkin saja tidak serumit yang ada di model-model statistik bisa sampai puluhan variabel untuk menentukan audit fee. Mungkin aja keputusannya dia bilang, oh kita lihat harga tahun lalu tambahin aja inflasi 5% misalnya. Mungkin aja seperti itu gitu. Jadi uh, riset uh, akuntansi itu harus dekat dengan grassroots, harus dekat dengan uh, mereka yang mengambil keputusan kalau menurut saya. Dan itu yang uh, susah ya karena... Uh, Susah mencari responden, susah mencari informan uh, yang mau terbuka, ya, yang mau ikut terlibat dalam uh, decision making, dalam riset gitu ya, sebagai informan. Di Indonesia terutama. 
Uh, berikutnya Pak Singgi uh, Nah untuk ke depan bagaimana ya uh, Saya tentunya sebagai akademisi Bapak dan Ibu semua Dan ini saya yakin banyak akademisi juga yang terlibat Dan mungkin mahasiswa pasca sarjana Ini kali pertama Pak Singgi Dalam sejarah DSAK Saya tuh udah ngecek anggota DSAK dari tahun 70-an ya Pak Baru kali pertama Anggota DSAK itu ada 4 orang akademisi Pak Duduk di DSAK ya. Saya rasa We have to make a difference lah gitu ya. Biasanya anggota DSAK itu cuma dua orang dari akademisi lainnya ya. Uh, dari KAP ya, dari pemerintah, dari OJK, perwakilan dan lain sebagainya. Nah, saya ingin uh, impian saya tuh, saya ingin uh, hubungan kita lebih dekat, lebih hangat ya. Antara Dewan Standar dengan akademisi. Dan itu sudah dilakukan oleh IASB. Uh, startingnya itu IASB itu punya forum akademisi Dewan Standar. itu uh, kali pertama tuh 2014 kalau nggak salah di Oxford mereka buat uh, setiap tahun kemudian mereka buat itu hanya 100 orang pak jadi mereka mengundang ada call for papersnya mereka mengundang akademisi untuk presentasi risetnya dan itu semua anggota IASB hadir ya ketuanya wakilnya semua dan mereka menjadi discussion mereka bertanya gitu jadi ada engagement yang real ya Nah itu uh, seperti ini menurut saya harus sering ditingkatkan nih Pak, kegiatan-kegiatan seperti ini ya. Uh, mungkin bisa gantian UGM nanti uh, tiga bulan lagi UNPA, tiga bulan lagi UNAIR begitu ya. Jadi uh, sebenarnya kan begini, draft exposure yang dikeluarkan oleh Dewan Standar saat ini uh, kebanyakan lebih dini ya. Misalnya seperti yang amandemen uh, kemarin PSAK 16 ya, mengenai uh, yang, biaya, yang testing ya, revenue dari testing. Itu dikeluarkan baru berlaku 2023 sudah kita keluarkan saat ini. Kenapa? Supaya punya waktu lebih banyak untuk para akademisi untuk mendiskusikannya di kelas ya. Uh, mencari evidence-nya. Ini kalau kita kalau kita terjadi nih bagi uh, berapa nih ap, apa dampaknya gitu. Nah, dosen-dosen akuntansi saya lihat juga banyak yang memiliki KJA, memiliki K, menjadi konsultan, banyak bergaul dengan perusahaan. Nah, itu berarti networking-nya luar biasa. Tadi seperti Pak Roger Simnet juga bilang kita perlu networking untuk mencari responden ya. Kita perlu uh, kedekatan dengan industri dan uh, teman-teman dosen-dosen akuntansi yang punya kedekatan dengan industri bisa membantu kita juga misalnya bar nyebar survei ke para uh, apa kliennya begitu ya tentang uh, penerapan standar. Seperti misalnya PwC Banking Survey mereka bikin tahun 2018 dan mereka bikin tahun 2020 lagi on the way katanya. Itu sangat useful kalau buat saya untuk memahami bagaimana penerapan PSK 71 ya selain juga survei yang dilakukan oleh OJK terhadap preparers. Nah, tapi kan PwC misalnya bisa melakukan itu karena dia punya klien gitu kan dia sebarin ke kliennya atau ke dalam networknya. Nah, itu yang harus kita harness ya, uh, network tra- akademisi itu harus kita manfaatkan ya. Dan uh, kita berharap begini ya, kita berharap juga uh, bagaimana riset-riset itu bisa dibaca. Riset-riset yang relevan bisa dibaca, dipertimbangkan oleh Dewan Standar ketika mengambil keputusan. Makanya misalnya uh, penting untuk anggota Dewan Standar, bukan hanya yang akademisi ya, tapi yang Dewan Standar. DSAK yang lain untuk misalnya ikut SNA gitu ya tim teknis ikut SNA di SNA itu banyak riset-riset tentang uh, penerapan standar dan lain sebagainya yang mungkin bisa bermanfaat untuk kita dalam mengambil keputusan uh, begitu mungkin dari saya Pak Singgi mungkin tidak sampai 10 menit ya uh, nanti mudah-mudahan apa banyak pertanyaan oh satu lagi mungkin Bu Linggar uh, ada pertanyaan tadi juga ada concern dari Bu Elvia juga ya Indonesia itu menarik nggak sih untuk ditulis kenapa Indonesia ya itu juga struggling waktu saya S3, bahkan memasukkan Indonesia ke dalam sampel saya, supervisor saya bolak-balik bilang, kamu jangan metang-metang orang Indonesia ya, terus Indonesia harus masuk jadi sampel kamu ya, harus dipikirkan, tapi saya orang yang selalu berpikir loh, Indonesia ini unik loh, jangan salah loh, ini kita itu gede banget, 250 juta akuntan tersebar di penduduk di berbagai pulau, jangan dibandingin sama Malaysia lah, atau Australia misalnya, yang cuma segitu doang gitu ya, kita itu besar sekali, sehingga apapun kalau buat saya Indonesia itu bisa menarik gitu, di level internasional ya sehingga gimana cara kita jualannya aja gitu ya cara jualannya aja itu cara jualan kita risetnya begitu mungkin Pak Singgi 
Mungkin ya, saya juga ya. mau ngambil waktunya Bu Devi nih. Silakan. Ya, terima kasih Bu Elsa. Bu, Bu Elvia telah mengajikan dua pemikiran yang saya kira sangat mencapu bagi uh, bagaimana seharusnya riset kita di Indonesia ke depan. Uh, kita dengarkan selanjutnya untuk uh, pandangan dan pemikiran dari Bu Devi. Silakan Bu Devi. Terima kasih Pak Singgi uh, atas kesempatan yang diberikan kepada saya. Uh, dalam waktu yang singkat ini saya coba to the point ya. Jadi di slide saya yang sebelah kiri itu saya coba tadi malam itu ya search di uh, Scopus gitu dengan menggunakan keyword IFRS dan um, Indonesia. Ya uh, kemudian keluar 51 kurang lebih ya 51 artikel. Itu yang muncul di title, abstrak, dan uh, keywordnya menggunakan itu. Nah, yang menarik adalah dari 51 artikel itu, ya di situ uh, mudah-mudahan kelihatan ya, meskipun ini enggak slide show. Yang orange itu, yang slice-nya, pisanya yang kecil itu, itu fokus di spesifik uh, PSAK. Jadi PSAK tertentu. Uh, menyoroti masalah motivasi dan benefitnya. Nah, yang biru itu uh, sebagian besar mengaitkan antara IFRS adoption, ya, jadi uh, variabelnya sudah jelas yang apanya IFRS adoption terhadap kualitas dari laporan keuangan. Nah, kualitas laporan keuangan itu sebagian besar ya value relevance, kemudian kualitas-kualitas uh, laba dan juga angka uh, akuntansi lainnya. Jadi kalau dari uh, figur itu, memang kita di Dewan Standar itu uh, pada saat awal berkomitmen untuk mengadopsi IFRS ini kan tentunya ya uh, bukan kita aja sebetulnya Indonesia ini keyakinannya ini harus membawa manfaat gitu, ya. harus membawa manfaat sehingga memang riset-riset yang biru itu memang penting gitu ya. Tetapi yang orange itu tidak kalah penting. Karena yang orange itu membantu kita untuk men mengembangkan standar, ya, termasuk melakukan amandemen, mengeluarkan standar baru, merevisi, dan lain sebagainya. Itu peran dari riset yang di bagian orange itu, dan itu kita hanya sedikit, ya, dari sampel yang saya ambil. Kemudian di sisi sebelah kanan, ini saya ambil dari paper yang baru aja keluar 2020 Juni kemarin, Nepler. Uh, ada framework yang bisa kita pakai ya untuk melakukan riset terkait dengan uh, standar. Sebetulnya bukan standar akuntansi keuangan saja semua semua standar bisa menggunakan framework ini secara umum gitu. Nah saya akan coba lihat satu-satu itu ya. Jadi yang ada A, B, C, D. Yang A itu adalah accounting effect. Jadi kalau accounting effect itu ya dampak penerapan standar terhadap angka-angka yang ada di laporan keuangan ya seperti kita melakukan analisa laporan keuangan dengan rasio-rasio itu ya. Nah, itu kita bisa melihat dari sisi recognition-nya ya misalnya kalau ada perubahan di situ, pengukurannya, presentasinya maupun disclosure-nya ya. Terutama tren ke depan ini kan maunya publik itu adalah supaya laporan keuangan itu tidak hanya mencatat yang sifatnya historical transaction saja, tapi juga memasukkan unsur-unsur masa depan di dalam laporan keuangan, sehingga kita bisa punya lebih banyak punya power untuk uh, digunakan dalam proses pengambilan keputusan. Kemudian uh, accounting effect itu tadi mempunyai dampak ya, yang tidak langsung, jadi kalau dampak langsungnya memang ke angka-angka laporan keuangan, tapi dari angka-angka laporan keuangan itu kita juga bisa melihat dampaknya dibagi menjadi tiga besar. Yang pertama dari sisi informasinya, jadi siapa yang menggunakan informasi ini? Yang menggunakan informasi bisa ditinjau dari pihak internal perusahaan, ya mungkin untuk uh, akuntansi manajemen, kemudian untuk pihak uh, eksternal, ya pihak eksternal itu bisa kreditor, bisa investor, bisa siapa aja. Kira-kira mereka itu benar-benar mendapat manfaat nggak dari adanya perubahan ini, perubahan dari segi rekognisi, pengukuran dan lain sebagainya. 
Kemudian juga yang tengah itu capital market effect. Nah ini yang yang banyak memang di sini yang tengah ini. Ya dampaknya terhadap harga saham, terhadap uh, cost of capital, baik itu debt maupun equity dan lain sebagainya. Kemudian yang terakhir real effect. Nah ini ini mulai jarang ini. Jadi real effect itu melihat dampak penerapan standar terhadap Uh, macam-macam gitu ya apa biaya yang dikeluarkan perusahaan uh, tinggi dalam rangka penerapan itu ataukah mungkin ada perubahan terhadap uh, kontraktualnya ya kalau kita bicara masalah PSAK 72 misalnya revenue itu uh, dari sisi kalau kita lihat industri telekomunikasi atau industri lainnya yang banyak menggunakan kontrak-kontrak gitu ya penjualan secara bundling nah, kira-kira mereka berubah nggak nih model penyusunan atau wording dari kontrak ini. Nah, kemudian motifnya apa ini? Mereka merubah ini motifnya apa? Apakah memang benar-benar niatnya untuk mencerminkan kondisi yang sebenarnya atau sekedar me- mengurangi biaya atau tidak mengeluarkan biaya gitu kan? Karena kalau menurut praktis, menurut pertimbangan saya, e, kalau saya misalnya perusahaan atau preparer, maka... E, diusahakan atau kalau bisa penerapan standar akuntansi ini jangan sampai menimbulkan biaya yang melebihi dari profit yang saya peroleh gitu kan logikanya kan begitu uh, jadi tujuan-tujuan ideal yang selama ini kita gaungkan dari sisi akademisi maupun dari sisi apa standar center itu bisa jadi mentah semua kalau kena uh, preparer gitu ya. karena preparer selalu membandingkan dengan profit saya gimana gitu ya profit saya gimana Memang misalnya penerapan PSA ke-72 mungkin menuntut uh, penerapan uh, sistem yang lebih canggih dan lain sebagainya. Cuman berapa biayanya gitu ya, kalau uh, profit saya, peningkatan profitnya nggak ada, kita invest seperti itu hanya untuk uh, menyajikan laporan keuangan nanti dulu gitu ya. Itu kan ada kemungkinan seperti itu menimbulkan resisten. Kemudian uh, behavioral, jadi kalau misalnya dampak behaviornya ini lagi-lagi yang Uh, bisa saya contohkan kalau PSAK 72 itu ya kalau dulu misalnya uh, yang namanya incremental cost jadi biaya untuk memperoleh kontrak itu sekarang kan dimungkinkan untuk dicatat sebagai aset ya kalau memang dia memiliki um, manfaat bersamaan dengan kontrak penjualan itu kalau dia dicatat sebagai aset otomatis kan dia akan diamortisasi nah ini kesempatan kan bagi perusahaan kalau dulunya biaya-biaya seperti ini mungkin biasanya langsung dicatat pada saat terjadinya sekarang standar membuka peluang untuk dilakukan uh, kapitalisasi dan amortisasi di periode selanjutnya nah apakah peluang ini kemudian nanti akan dimanfaatkan perusahaan mungkin lebih baik kalau gitu saya menggunakan aja uh, pihak ketiga gitu ya agen untuk jual lebih enak seperti itu daripada saya harus ngurus semuanya dari awal sendiri biaya yang terjadi belum tentu boleh dikapitalisasi harus dicatat langsung sebagai expense tapi kalau saya pakai pihak ketiga itu kan bisa masuk sebagai uh, biaya kontrak ya ya contoh-contoh seperti itu kemudian juga mungkin kalau regulatory effect efek ini kadangkala mungkin di salah satu negara itu ada aturan maksimal harga untuk produk ini tidak boleh lebih dari sekian gitu sehingga kalau kita bicara multinational company mungkin penerapan uh, PS apa atau uh, standar akuntansi yang baru ini bisa menimbulkan satu gesekan gitu pada saat uh, di sini harusnya sudah harus diakui tapi menurut uh, apa menurut aturan yang berlaku nggak boleh melebihi nilai tertentu ya gesekan gesekan seperti itu kemudian tax dan dividend sudah nggak perlu dibahas lagi karena dampaknya kalau misalnya kontrak itu berubah ya terutama kalau menurut saya PSAK 72 itu akan sangat berimbas pada perusahaan-perusahaan yang memiliki yang biasanya menjual produk itu bundling ya atau uh, dengan pembelian dengan pembelian ya jadi ada uh, apa ada hadiah-hadiah atau promosi yang dikaitkan dengan penjualan itu nah itu potensi di situ. Jadi kontrak yang tadinya kita anggap jualan satu barang bisa dimungkinkan ternyata sekarang dari sisi PO itu enggak satu tapi lebih dari satu. Kalau seperti itu maka kita ngomong kapan boleh merekognisinya gitu ya barengan atau berbeda-beda. Nah, kalau berbeda-beda kan ini jadi kasus nih karena enggak semua penjualan jadi enggak bisa di 
akui di periode ini tapi harus di default. Nah itu kemudian perusahaan mulai berpikir kan, wah kalau gitu saya rugi dong buat kontrak kayak gini gitu ya. Jadi penjualan-penjualan yang sifatnya add-on sekarang mungkin akan berkurang mungkin saja gitu ya. Nah hal-hal seperti itu sebetulnya yang menarik untuk kita lihat gitu ya. Apakah ada apa, kecenderungan untuk perubahan perilaku uh, dari perusahaan itu ya? Atau mungkin pemberian uh, skema-skema uh, apa namanya? Komisi dan lain sebagainya pasti akan uh, berubah. Dan kemudian kalau yang banyak didengungkan sekarang penerapan PSAK baru ini menimbulkan uh, banyak biaya gitu. Yang terjadi justru hasil penelitian di Eropa itu nggak seperti itu gitu profilnya. Biayanya itu justru justru nggak naik gitu ya di tahun-tahun penerapan awal mereka. Nah bagaimana dengan di Indonesia? Gitu ya kalau mereka argumennya biayanya mahal, oke. Okay. Dari sisi apa biaya macam-macam audit fee boleh, dari sisi information system boleh kita lihat buktinya di laporan keuangan meningkat atau tidak. Dari segi manpower ya tentunya akan kita butuh tenaga yang lebih ahli dan lain sebagainya. Biaya terkait itu konsultan dan lain sebagainya meningkat enggak dengan penerapan PSAK itu. Mungkin PSAK yang satu dengan yang lain dampaknya berbeda terhadap biaya-biaya tersebut. Tergantung juga dengan jenis industri dan lain sebagainya. Nah ini saya contohkan. Uh, research question gitu ya kalau tadi Bu Elvia bilang bahwa nggak harus data kuantitatif Bu Ersa juga bilang situ saya nggak uh, bisa lebih setuju dari itu ya artinya saya sangat setuju bahwa kalau misalnya data kuantitatif itu belum tersedia kenapa kita tidak eksperimen gitu ya eksperimen ini uh, memang mendesainnya harus takes time gitu ya tetapi kalau kita ngomong sudah selesai Analisanya lebih cepat, jadi kurang lebih kebalikannya menurut saya itu uh, waktunya agak berkebalikan dengan archival. Oke, okay, kita lihat di sini bagaimana, bagaimana forward looking information itu direfleksikan dalam laporan keuangan, dimasukkan dalam laporan keuangan ini dorongan ini, dorongan kepada uh, standar akuntansi keuangan untuk memasukkan yang namanya forward looking information dari, dari user. Akhirnya dengan segala macam jatuh bangun dan uh, perjuangan ya sudah kurang lebih lebih dari 10 tahun uh, kita masukkan itu ya kita masukkan itu salah satunya di PSAK 71 kalau Bapak Ibu mungkin uh, sudah membaca PSAK ini di situ ada tadi juga uh, salah satu panelis dari Australia uh, sudah menjelaskan ada intinya kita harus mengakui pencadangan kerugian atas aset yang kita miliki sejak awal Gitu ya. Jadi kalau dulu menggunakan incurred loss itu kan kita mencadangkan kalau terjadi indikasi kerugian. Ya, nah kalau sekarang nggak usah nunggu indikasi. Sejak awal kita memiliki aset itu tolong dicadangkan kerugiannya. Jadi aset yang sehat-sehat saja bisa dimungkinkan atau bukan dimungkinkan harus dilakukan pencadangan. Ya, itu namanya metodenya expected loss itu tadi. Nah. Yang menarik kemudian praktek seperti ini ini kan menimbulkan satu satu kondisi e, di kalimat berikutnya itu ya. Jadi kalau misalnya perusahaan itu memiliki aset ya jumlahnya itu tetap dibanding tahun kemarin, tetapi resikonya meningkat maka jumlah allowance-nya naik. Itu kondisi pertama. Kondisi yang kedua asetnya meningkat. Jadi perusahaan ini dalam kondisi growth ya, dalam kondisi baik nih. Jadi asetnya meningkat, risknya stabil. Dari sisi allowance meningkat juga kan? Kalau kita melihatnya dari sisi pencadangan, dari sisi biaya yang harus dicadangkan untuk kerugian atas aset, dua hal ini berpotensi menghasilkan nilai yang sama atau paling tidak sama-sama meningkat. Nah, ini kan menarik sebetulnya. Ya, dari segi data memang oke okay, kita belum ada karena kita baru menerapkan kemarin di awal tahun. Tapi ini bisa dijadikan eksperimen gitu ya. Coba kira-kira investor itu kalau disajikan dua data ini itu bias enggak ya? Ya, jangan-jangan nanti uh, semuanya ini dianggap jelek gitu ya? Karena dia langsung melihat ke nilai cadangan yang meningkat. Nah kalau misalnya ini hasilnya itu investor itu ternyata menilai perusahaan yang dalam kategori growth ini di apa dinilai jelek oleh investor lah kan gagal berarti standar ini SAK 71 ini jadi kan kita harus melakukan sesuatu gitu ya wah ini ada yang salah ini berarti 
karena tujuan dari standar itu bukan itu gitu ya standar itu kan muncul manakala sudah terjadi ketidakseimbangan gitu ya di antara di antara kita ada yang dirugikan gitu ya sehingga perlu distandarisasi nah standarisasi ini tujuan akhirnya tentu efisiensi ya supaya gimana supaya lebih efisien gitu kita ini nah kalau hasilnya seperti itu kan perusahaan yang dalam sukan disikut malah dirugikan harusnya dia mungkin bisa dapat uang masuk dari investasi jadi nggak jadi investornya lari nah itu itu satu contoh nah di PS ya di PS AK 72 dan 73 juga saya rasa seperti itu ya uh, sedikit lagi Pak Singgi untuk yang leasing misalnya uh, intinya kita sekarang menggunakan lebih banyak finance lease nah Pertanyaan yang menarik adalah apakah kemudian lender atau uh, apa uh, si pemberi modal itu akan berpengaruh terhadap cost of debt yang diberikan ke perusahaan dengan adanya memasukkan utang yang tadinya tidak masuk ke dalam laporan keuangan sekarang masuk itu kan seharusnya diapresiasi ya atau cuma sama aja dengan yang sebelumnya. Ya, jadi saya rasa uh, ide-ide seperti itu. Uh, bisa dilakukan tidak harus dengan archival, dengan eksperimen, dengan survei, dengan interview, mix method, semua kita terbuka. Sekian Pak Singgih, terima kasih. Baik, terima kasih Bu Devi yang telah memberikan insight mengenai bagaimana ya pemetaan penelitian di akuntansi serta juga bagaimana kondisi existing di dalam literatur penelitian akuntansi di Indonesia. Nah, gini gilirannya untuk uh, tanya jawab, hanya saja mengingat waktu hanya tinggal kurang lebih 20 menit. Saya akan hanya mengambil satu pertanyaan, kemudian saya sudah melihat tadi juga ada sekian daftar pertanyaan yang sudah muncul uh, maka mau nanti Bu Elvia semoga sudah bisa bergabung kembali suaranya bisa nyanyi mohon dites Bu Elvia baik sudah, terima kasih Bu, ya, Bu Elsa dan Bu Devi uh, saya memberikan satu pertanyaan barangkali mohon dijawab dengan uh, uh, singkat untuk kemudian kita berlanjut dengan sesi para partisipan Nah pertanyaan saya adalah berkaitan dengan uh, satu yang barangkali krusial dari sisi akademisi terutama mereka yang berkarir dan didorong ini dari kemendikbud mereka berekspektasi bahwa ini uh, para akademisi ini harus kemudian uh, publikasi di top tier jurnal sehingga kemudian uh, uh, pertanyaan selanjutnya yang muncul apakah kemudian penelitian-penelitian yang tadi banyak didiskusikan itu pada konteks sekarang di Indonesia itu cukup publikasi yang kemudian uh, terpublikasi dan dengan asumsi bahwa publik, uh, uh, penelitian yang terpublikasi itu secara metodologi akan sangat robust ya baik itu archival atau behavior itu akan kemudian uh, berdampak bagi standar center tentunya tapi pertanyaan uh, pertanyaan yang ada apakah memang benar bahwa masih minim publikasi yang ada di Indonesia yang kemudian terpublikasi dan sehingga secara impact kepada standar setter juga uh, lebih minim atau kalau dibalik pertanyaannya haruskah kemudian penelitian yang dilakukan itu terpublikasi supaya juga sejalan dengan apa yang mereka uh, menjadi interest di kalangan akademisi monggo dari Bu Elvia kemudian uh, Bu Ersa dan Bu Devi Baik, baik Pak Singgi, saya mulai duluan kali ya sebentar ya Pak. Um, tadi saya sudah katakan, yang penting itu kalau kita mau mengemukakan sesuatu, empirical evidence kita, menggunakan primary atau secondary data, itu it's, um, uh, ada juga kolom pertanyaan tadi, apakah sebaiknya menggunakan primary atau secondary data. Sebetulnya tidak masalah menggunakan primary atau secondary data, utamanya adalah yang tadi itu. Bagaimana hasil penelitian kita ini punya impactful dan bisa didengarkan oleh mereka perilaku yang ada di other part of the world gitu ya. Why should they bother about your research? Itu yang paling utama. Jadi bukan hanya soal unik saja, tapi yang penting mereka itu kenapa masih harus tahu sih tentang misalnya hak guna bangunan misalnya atau mungkin hak atas tanah tadi gitu ya. Mengapa mereka harus tahu tentang dampak COVID research ini ke uh, COVID-19 ini terhadap uh, perusahaan-perusahaan uh, UMKM misalnya dan lain sebagainya. Jadi uh, why do they have to bother? 
Yang kedua itu uniqueness dari segi metodologi Pak uh, Pak Singgi. Jadi ketajaman kita menganalisa data itu penting sekali. Ketajaman menganalisa data. Jangan cuma copy paste. Ini katanya data primernya per, bilangnya seperti ini. Terus aku copy paste, copy paste aja. Tapi tidak ada analisa. Misalnya kita tidak tahu the story behind di data yang disajikan tadi gitu loh. Misalnya dia bicara tentang oh kita melakukan akuisisi merger akuisisi karena kelihatannya kan besar Bu gitu kan. Kalau dia bilang kan usaha kita jadi besar. Itu kan pasti ada di benaknya itu ada motivasi. Motivasi apa yang akan kita pelajari. Jadi analisanya juga harus tajam. Selain juga mungkin tadi kita punya yang inovatif dari segi analisanya. Tadi saya pas keputus itu lagi cerita tentang snippets Pak. Sebetulnya uh, kita sama-sama di European Accounting Association itu kita sama-sama selalu mengembangkan penelitian kalau member ya kalau Bapak dan Ibu jadi member mengembangkan satu metodologi penelitian yang yang uh, inovatif gitu. Jadi uh, salah satu dari pembicara itu Profesor Stefan Hollander itu melihat dengan menggunakan metode yang kita sebut sebagai snippets. Ini datanya adalah data yang rich, uh, rich text based data dari uh, corporate websites, dari disclosure. Dia ketik aja COVID-19 dan financial exposure. Dilihat. Dia lihat ke kiri, ke kanan, 10 kata ke kiri, 10 kata ke kanan. Apa dampak COVID-19 terhadap perusahaan? Itu nggak usah nunggu nanti annual report selesai. Itu kita bisa lihat dari corporate websites mereka. Bisa lihat dari letter to shareholders mereka. Bisa lihat dari minutes of meetingnya. Bisa lihat dari segala macam data yang kita dapatkan dari secondary maupun primary data yang kita bisa langsung tanyakan kepada uh, perusahaan yang bersangkutan. Tadi ada masukan dari Pak Sabab Hutajulu, bagaimana dengan konfirmasi kepada perusahaan? Karena the story behind the data itu kadang-kadang kelewatan oleh peneliti. Gitu loh. Apa yang terjadi di belakang angka-angka tadi. Maka saya nggak seberapa... Uh, 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 apa namanya uh, ngefan sama yang namanya kuantitatif data saja karena saya selalu lihat di belakang itu ada cerita apa misalnya tadi tentang motivasi early adopters ceritanya banyak banget itu pak kenapa mereka melakukan early adopters dibandingkan dengan yang lain gitu apakah itu karena melulu karena ada logika uh, keuntungan saja yang di, uh, diinginkan atau ada logika yang lain itu saja pak Singgi uh, terima pak. kasih Bu Elvia jadi ini tentu saja konteks yang disampaikan Bu Elvia dan ketika riset di Indonesia itu informing other country people, other country standard setter atau even international standard setter, akhirnya juga akan kemudian berimplikasi balik dalam konteks Indonesia. Sehingga ini sesuatu yang kemudian uh, membuka wacana kita bahwa penelitian di kita itu nampaknya bisa kemudian berlaku internasional dan juga kemudian berdampak baik secara barangkali konsekuensi ekonominya kembali ke negara kita. Bu Ersa, silakan Bu Ersa untuk merespon. Baik Pak Singgi, uh, kalau saya melihatnya gini ya Pak, semua riset kalau bisa terpublikasi. Kan sayang kalau tidak dipublikasikan, duduk aja di meja atau apa. Jadi terpublikasi ya, kadang-kadang terpublikasi juga uh, kalau nunggu sampai jurnal Q1, apa, prosesnya ada 2 tahun, 3 tahun gitu kan, ya udahlah jurnal yang lebih masuk akal misalnya gitu ya. Kalau saya kadang-kadang, Ya udah terpublikasi aja dulu ya sehingga nanti orang bisa tahu ya. Nah, eh, saya pernah melakukan literatur review Pak untuk eh, semua paper yang IFRS konvergen dan Indonesia tentang IFRS konvergen isunya itu puncaknya ada di 2014 2015 Pak. Jadi kurvnya itu dari 2010 kita lihat sampai 2016, 2016 sudah mulai turun lagi. Puncaknya di 2014 2015 banyak karena pada saat itu karena kita konvergensinya di 2012 2011-2012 baru ada datanya, itu kan di 2012-2013 ya. Kemudian dibikin papernya, kemudian terpublishnya 2014-2015. Jadi memang ada lag time antara uh, data dan juga publikasi. Dugaan saya, paper-paper yang dipublish 2014-2015, itu sudah risetnya itu dibuat, datanya rata-rata dibuat sampai 2012 gitu kan. 2012 data, 2000, uh, papernya dibuat 2013, kemudian dipublish 2014-2015. Dari 164 paper yang kita lihat, Pak, 72 persen itu kuantitatif, Pak. Jadi sedikit sekali yang kualitatif, ya, rata-rata kuantitatif, dan rata-rata uh, apa positivism lah ya, ininya paradigmanya. Uh, jadi saya memantau terus sih, jadi ini mungkin nanti akan saya buat, kebetulan ini paper sudah publish di Jurnal Akuntansi Investasi, uh, mengenai literatur review secara overall, saya pengen tahu, 
karena saya sering ditanya gitu di forum internasional, gimana sih dampak konvergensi IFRS ke Indonesia tuh secara general dampaknya seperti apa? Itu kan pertanyaan simpel aja Pak ya, kalau kita conference sama IASB, kita conference kemana, itu pasti ditanyain gitu. Dampaknya coba, Ersa kamu tahu gak sih dampak secara general apa gitu? Nah, daripada saya bikin sendiri, udah saya kumpulin aja tuh semua paper-paper yang ten- menjawab pertanyaan itu ya. Banyak sekali ada tentang ke accounting quality, ada tentang ke earning management, semuanya kita lihat. Dan itu masih mix Pak ininya, uh, apanya tuh? Findingnya ya, ada yang positif mengurangi earning management, ada yang meningkatkan earning quality, accounting quality, ada juga yang enggak. Jadi uh, saya juga baca bingung ini karena metodologinya beda-beda atau bagaimana kok hasilnya beda-beda banyak. Kita padahal sudah saring tuh uh, jurnalnya yang bagus, terus uh, apa uh, universitasnya juga yang bagus kayak gitu sudah sudah mulai kita saring. Nah tetapi maksud saya uh, adalah Uh, saya melihat kecenderungan ya Pak ya uh, publikasi mengenai IFRS convergence, IFRS adoption, dampak IFRS itu menurun sejak 2014, uh, 2015-2016 karena apa? Karena uh, dulu kita kan big bang approach ya 2011-2012 tuh bang gitu kan kita konvergensi IFRS sehingga itu jadi menarik dan saya ingat 2011-2011 tuh banyak banget apa IFRS center, IFRS center di universitas banyak sekali seminar-seminar EOT ke para dosen sehingga itu kemudian menjadi isu. Nah sekarang ini isunya itu kan mulai uh, parsial dan sangat spesifik. Tadi ada pasal 71, Bu Devi cerita, pasal 72, pasal 73. Sehingga dosen-dosen itu perlu mengupdate what is going on untuk bisa mendapatkan research questions gitu kan. Nah saya sering sering ditanya kan, Bu uh, ada topik apa nih Bu yang menarik gitu. Uh, topik riset apa nih dari Bu Ersa yang menarik. Sementara di otak saya tuh banyak banget research question yang Saya tuh nggak punya energi lagi untuk melakukan riset karena saking banyaknya yang saya pengen tanyakan sebetulnya. Kenapa saya punya banyak research question? Karena saya following uh, isu-isunya IASB, saya ngikutin uh, IASB itu ngapain gitu kan, IFRIC itu ngapain, kemudian DSAK juga ngapain gitu. Banyak exposure draft yang keluar dan itu sebenarnya uh, research question bisa dari situ. Nah yang ada itu sekarang ini, uh, memang diperlukan bukan cuma waktu ya Pak, bukan cuma investasi di waktu tapi juga interest. Saya melihat uh, yang 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 melihat standar setting sebagai isu yang seksi itu sedikit, Pak. Yang mau mengikuti secara telaten, secara semangat, secara itu tuh sedikit gitu ya maksudnya. Jadi kadang-kadang dosen itu, dosen akuntansi keuangan itu memandang oh ya ini PSK berubah lagi. Jadi beban malah gitu loh untuk mempelajari <laughs> mengikuti perubahan itu jadi beban gitu. <laughs> Bukan jadi sesuatu yang excited ya. Kenapa sih ini berubah? Alasannya apa? Siapa yang membawa perubahan? Kenapa sih ASB merubah LIBOR reform? Ya, LIBOR reform ini dari mana isunya gitu ya? Nah, itu kalau kita sudah interested di bidang itu, itu dan akan apa mengikuti pergerakan perubahan gitu ya. Itu uh, tidak akan jadi beban gitu kan, Pak. Kita membaca, kita ngikutin website YASB, kita kadang-kadang mungkin terlibat ya dalam seminar-seminar dan lain sebagainya. Uh, itu mungkin, Pak, yang dari saya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Bu Ersa, singkat barangkali 4 menit Bu Devi, sehingga 11.15 kita bisa memberikan uh, jawaban atas beberapa pertanyaan dari audiens, silakan Bu Devi. Oke, saya selalu, saya bersyukur selalu urutan terakhir Pak, <laughs> karena waktunya nah. masih mepet. Uh, <laughs> Kalau menurut saya pertanyaan Pak Singgi tadi, uh, kenapa uh, tadi ya seperti uh, apa pencarian saya di Scopus yang sekilas tadi sedikit tadi itu menurut saya um, satu akses terhadap SAK itu yang dibatasi itu bermasalah Pak. Karena kalau kita ingin meneliti lebih fokus ke masing-masing standar, katakan apa SAK 72 tadi, nggak bisa nggak harus baca standarnya. Oh kita ya udah baca berkali-kali aja masih bundeli ya Pak. Masih suka bingung gitu ya Apalagi yang tidak punya akses Nah yang tidak punya akses itu cenderungnya mereka hanya googling mendapatkan ID Nah ID kan kita tahu sendiri prosesnya masih panjang Jadi akses ke PSAK itu harus diberikan dulu Ya ini, ini kritik Saya nggak tahu ini kritik kepada diri saya sendiri kayaknya gitu ya Kemudian uh, kalau masalah dipublish atau tidak dengan data Indonesia hmm, Kalau menurut saya kita jangan pesimis gitu Pak Kita sangat pesimis. Ada banyak keunikan yang kita miliki di Indonesia, gitu ya. Uh, satu hal kecil yang saya tahu mungkin dari sisi audit, gitu ya. Uh, saya merasakan sendiri bagaimana sulitnya menjual data Indonesia keluar, gitu ya. 
ke jurnal internasional uh, karena jumlah kita itu terbatas jumlah data itu ya dan itu hand collected sehingga kita kalau suruh nambah lagi ya kira-kira nangis gitu loh pak ya di samping dananya juga terbatas tetapi kita itu mempunyai uniqueness itu yang membuat mereka nggak mau ngelepas uniqueness apa yang waktu itu saya coba angkat pada saat itu kita mempunyai dua aturan rotasi yaitu rotasi auditor dan rotasi KAP dalam waktu yang bersamaan dalam kurun waktu yang cukup lama tidak ada negara di dunia ini yang menerapkan dua rotasi itu secara bersamaan dalam kurun waktu 10 tahun rata-rata itu paling nggak sampai lima tahun sudah menyerah ya kita itu sampai lebih dari 10 tahun dan harusnya kita bangga seperti dengan itu namun ternyata akhirnya ya dihapus juga nah itu sebetulnya kan riset setting yang menarik yang bisa dijual termasuk juga di akuntansi keuangan saya rasa kita jangan berkecil hati gitu ya kalau misalnya tidak bisa bersaing dari dalam hal segi jumlah untuk kuantitatif uh, kita bisa pakai eksperimen tadi atau survei gitu ya itu kan kita justru jenis-jenis uh, riset yang seperti itu uh, sangat menarik bagi mereka karena di sana juga jarang saya rasa itu pasti nih terima kasih uh. Terima kasih Bu Devi. Uh, saya, saya kira untuk akses PSAK tadi uh, pada kesempatan ini harus kita sampaikan bahwa akses terhadap PSAK sangat mudah sekarang Bapak Ibu ya. Tinggal masuk ke Google Play kemudian ke tag SAK pasti akan ketemu dan bisa mengakses sana. Tapi jangan lupa menjadi anggota YAI tentu saja. Nah uh, itu Pak. <laughs> saya kira itu uh, Profesi yang harus kita kembangkan sama-sama Baik Pak Akbar Terima kasih telah menampilkan tayangan Saya kira ada tiga slide pertanyaan Monggo pertanyaan yang Slide pertama ditampilkan uh, Yang pertama dari Pak Wahyu Satria Apakah regulator atau otoritas Boleh menerbit, menerbitkan standar Yang mempengaruhi pelaporan keuangan Suatu entitas dengan Pertimbangan untuk menjaga Stabilitas sistem keuangan Monggo barangkali ini Bu Ersa ingin menyampaikan terlebih dahulu. Ya. Jadi lebih pada general accepted accounting principle barangkali jadinya Bu Ersa kita punya ya. SRK, konteksnya seperti itu. Monggo Bu Ersa. Uh, Pak Wahyu, terima kasih pertanyaannya Pak Wahyu. Uh, tentunya uh, kita nggak bisa ngatur rumah orang ya Pak Wahyu ya. Kalau saya dimin- ditanyain baga- apakah OJK atau Bank Indonesia atau BPK atau siapalah regulator lain. Bisa nggak mem- uh, mem- menerbitkan standar ya Itu sudah cukup uh, jelas aturannya di uh, Ada di PSAK 25 dan ada di ISAK 32 uh, Mengenai hierarki uh, standar Mungkin itu kali Pak, normatif jawaban saya gitu <tuh> karena, <tuh> karena setiap regulator pasti punya purpose yang berbeda-beda Saya, saya, saya memiliki empati ya terhadap OJK misalnya, dia banyak mengeluarkan uh, relaksasi-relaksasi demi untuk menjaga financial stability. Karena memang itu mandatnya dia gitu, mandatnya OJK itu financial stability. Nah mandatnya DSAK apa? Mandatnya DSAK itu membuat standar yang comparable dengan international praktek, yang bisa menimbul, yang bisa menampilkan laporan keuangan sesuai dengan kenyataannya Bapak dan Ibu ya. Jadi kalau memang kenyataan bisnis lagi jelek, lagi resesi, lagi susah, Ya kenapa terus laporan keuangannya harus terlihat bagus menawan dan cemerlang begitu ya. Jadi lap, e, standar akuntansi yang baik menurut saya yang bersifat principle base dan bisa menampilkan e, me, memunculkan e, laporan keuangan e, yang apa adanya dalam adalah mati e, memunculkan lah gitu. Nah e, sekalian e, jawaban e, pertanyaan dengan Mbak Anggun ya Mbak Muriska Utami. Uh, saya kebetulan Pak Singgi, kemarin kan ini saya sempat ngecek tuh, minta riset, riset asisten, lihat laporan keuangan perbankan Q2, lihat laporan keuangan perusahaan manufaktur Q2, apakah yang Q2 manufaktur ada nggak impairment di inventory? Karena logikanya pandemi ini pasti uh, uh, inventorinya pasti banyak gitu, karena ada PSBB dan lain sebagainya, kemudian kemud- ada impairment inventory, ya. Di Q2-nya nggak ada Pak, Kita saya cari tuh CALK-nya. Terus kemudian diperbankan juga ada nggak kenaikan CKPN? Gak ada juga. Ya, jadi uh, yaitu either kita itu uh, rada telat gitu para preparer bikin laporan keuangan kuartalannya ya untuk menyerap dampak Covid atau ya mereka semua nunggu aja entar sampai anwar report gitu kan akhir tahun. Nah, itu uh, uh, apa namanya ya? Bagaimana mendeteksi adanya kecurangan? Ya kalau saya sih secara logika harusnya Q2 itu sudah ada dampak, karena kan dari bulan Maret ya, Maret, Juni, Juli. Harusnya ada dampak impairment terhadap goodwill, ada dampak macam-macam. Yang paper dampak COVID terhadap impairment goodwill aja sudah publish, itu di China. Sudah ada dampak pandemi terhadap impairment goodwill. 
karena dan itu signifikan karena laporan keuangannya sudah mencerminkan hal itu gitu di China itu. Kalau di kita kita bikin kayak gitu bisa dampaknya nggak signifikan karena laporan keuangan kita tidak mencerminkan hal itu belum gitu untuk Q2. Terima kasih Bu Elsa. Segera kemudian uh, uh, yang kedua mungkin Bu, Bu Devi. Tapi sebelum ke Bu Devi uh, dalam konteks regulator memang uh, kita dalam standar sektor itu selalu berfokus pada quality of financial reporting dan itu menjadi refleksi fungsi perlindungan investor. Tapi kita juga paham sebenarnya regulator dan otoritas lainnya akan memiliki fungsi dan hal lain yang kemudian memiliki cakupan barangkali lebih makro yang harus dipertimbangkan sehingga mungkin ada kebijakan yang harus dibuat di sana. Baik Bu Bu Devi, kemudian yang terakhir nanti monggo Bu Elvia untuk kemudian menutupnya. Monggo Bu Devi untuk mengadres isu no- nomor 3 atau nomor 2 barangkali. Yeah. Uh, aduh, kalau saya itu bukan aliran yang membedakan riset itu berdasarkan S1, S2, S3 ya. Artinya kan kita bicara ini dokumen akademik ya penelitian uh, penelitian akademik itu rambu-rambunya itu se- sama kan level apapun tuh sama gitu ya cuman mungkin uh, uh, apa jenis pengujiannya aja kalau level S1 mungkin nggak perlu robustness dan lain sebagainya ada yang bilang seperti itu tapi kalau rambu-rambunya semua harus sama etikanya semua yang diikuti harus sama jadi kalau menurut saya ini tidak membedakan S1, S2, S3 karena dari segi data, dari segi ide, dari segi research question tadi itu kan uh, hal yang mudah dicerna ya. Selama kita sudah membaca, memahami standarnya. Nah itu tadi yang maksud saya akses terhadap standar. Saya sendiri menyadari mahasiswa saya S1 itu uh, membaca SAK itu susah sekali nyuruhnya ya. Itu pada uh, mereka selalu meminta Uh, standarnya bu mana bu standarnya bu sementara saya sendiri tidak bisa memberi kecuali yang ada di library gitu ya nah, untuk datang ke library itu tidak masa covid aja susah gitu ya apalagi zaman sekarang jadi uh, saya rasa untuk yang mbak Bernadia ya Bernadia ini harus seperti apa sama saja mbak jadi tidak 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 membandang itu penelitian dari mana yang penting uh, topiknya itu tajam mengena apalagi kalau dia mengarah pada standar tertentu dan perlakuan tertentu seperti saya tadi misalnya saya contohkan perlakuan antara uh, incurred loss sama expected credit loss nah, itu menarik saya rasa saya rasa itu pak singgi terima kasih bu bu devi barangkali kata kunci kata singkatnya adalah ketika Uh, riset itu mampu memberikan kontribusi yang jelas baik pada regulator baik uh, terutama pada literatur yang itu akan kemudian distinct dan memiliki kontribusi meskipun levelnya kita seharusnya tidak membedakan di S1, S2, S3 Bu Elvia untuk yang terakhir barangkali Bu Elvia uh, COVID-19 mungkin sejalan dengan survei yang Ibu uh, juga lakukan dan ini bicara mengenai sebuah prediksi tadi beberapa sudah diberikan insightnya oleh Bu Ersa mungkin ada additional comment dari Bu Elvia, silakan baik Pak Singgi tadi uh, N sendiri juga bicara tentang penelitian kalau kita mau bawa jadi disertasi S3 misalnya atau mungkin uh, mereka yang melakukan master by research untuk disertasi S2 ya jadi lebih ke forward looking daripada kita melihat masa lalu nah, itu penting sekali, ini, ini pertanyaannya baik sekali ya jadi uh, kalau kita ngelihat gimana ke depannya nah itu misalnya salah satunya yang seperti yang kita lakukan tentang uh, revisiting asumsi daripada going concerns. Nah, uh, pertanyaan Bapak, eh, pertanyaan Mbak, uh, Mbak Anggun tentang uh, dampak COVID ini, kalau mereka melakukan kecurangan atau atau tidak, itu sebetulnya banyak sekali cara untuk mendeteksinya ya, uh, dengan measurements yang begitu banyak sekali. Uh, misalnya salah satunya itu dengan melihat dari earnings quality salah satu ya discretionary accruals. Jadi kalau misalnya kita run dalam bentuk regresi apapun juga, yang pasti langsung ketemu itu E-nya, epsilonnya atau disturbance errornya itu besar sekali. Nah kalau epsilonnya itu besar sekali nilainya cukup signifikan, nah itu yang perlu kita teliti lebih lanjut. Ada apa di dalamnya? Karena itu yang dapat menjelaskan ya secara kita, kita peneliti secara matematis ada apa di dalamnya. Nah, jadi e, tentu saja kita mesti familiar dengan berbagai cara teknik, mesti harus banyak baca dari berbagai itu. Memang e, tertangkap. Tapi semuanya itu kan kita juga check and recheck, ya nggak? Kan kita nggak percaya 
100% pada annual report, kita kan juga bisa check and recheck dengan misalnya dengan berbagai informasi yang kita miliki. Uh, itu uh, anu, anu saya apa namanya? Jadi Anda memang harus banyak membaca untuk melihat mengenai pengukuran-pengukuran yang terjadi. Sudah banyak sekali paper yang mengetahui mengukur mengenai uh, terjadinya fraud atau kecurangan atau tidak itu uh, ter, ter, khususnya juga kita ter, bisa bisa cek dan recheck dengan dokumen-dokumen lainnya. Saya setuju dengan Ibu Devi tadi mengenai impactful research untuk uh, uh, mahasiswa S1. Justru ya, justru saya uh, kalau saya bimbing mahasiswa S1 saya itu justru uh, quite unik gitu loh. Dibandingkan kalau saya misalnya bimbing mahasiswa S3. Karena mungkin sudah eh, belum terkontaminasi ini. Ini masih masih apa ya namanya istilahnya masih uh, masih asli gitu. Culun gitu ya kalau bahasanya anak gaul kita itu. Jadi uh, idenya itu kadang-kadang Iya ya, nggak pernah kepikiran selama ini gitu ya. Jadi eh, gimana kita yang sebagai pembimbingnya justru yang akan membawa keunikan yang keculunan tadi itu menjadi suatu yang punya impactful gitu loh. Jadi kalau masih mendekatin saya bu, bagaimana dengan ini ini ini? Sesuatu yang benar belum belum pernah kita terpikirkan menjadi sesuatu yang bisa besar selama tadi kita bisa uh, jual ke, atau kita bisa tawarkan kepada jurnal kepada publikasi internasional. Yang penting tadi bahwa mereka perlu melihat dari uh, uh, studi ini memang bisa digunakan di tempat yang lain atau mereka bisa juga menjadi revisit their assumptions and their policy. Uh, pertanyaan pertama sedikit mungkin saya nambahkan tentang Bu Ersa. Saya rasa uh, pada perjalanannya memang kita itu sebetulnya kalau kita bicara normatif ya, kita memang selalu seiring sejalan. Artinya kita gandengan sama-sama, mengeluarkan, kita sudah punya ranahnya sendiri-sendiri. Standar ini siapa yang mengeluarkan, siapa yang tanggung jawab. Kemudian OJK uh, bertanggung jawab untuk apa. Saya rasa kita semua sudah tahu bahwa itu memang punya ranah sendiri-sendiri. Namun dalam perjalanannya, secara normatif kita lihat seperti itu. Tapi di perjalanannya seringkali ada urgensi, ada urgensi. Nah, urgensi itu yang membuat kadang-kadang uh, standar standar setters itu uh, apa namanya uh, tidak harus menunggu dari standar setters. Jadi uh, kebetulan regulators itu bergeraknya harus kita harus cepat keluar sekarang ini. Nah, kadang-kadang itu keluar, tapi bukan berarti it, keluar polisi dari regulators bukan berarti tidak diskusi dengan kita. Jadi uh, tidak kalau dibilang pertanyaan ini saya rasa mungkin boleh menerbitkan standar tentu saja with the uh, Uh, catatan dengan catatan bahwa mereka telah mendiskusikannya dengan kita tentu saja itu supaya kita ada koordinasi kalau enggak nanti kan bisa bertabrakan itu saja Pak Singgi baik terima kasih luar biasa uh, uh, para penjaji kita hari ini telah memberikan insight dari dua sisi clearly di sini dari sisi pandangan akademisi uh, yang memang Bapak ibu-ibu ini merupakan akademisi uh, dari Universitas Ternama sekaligus menjadi anggota DSAK sehingga dua sisi ini telah diberikan kepada Bapak Ibu semua partisipan yang setia sampai pada akhir acara ini uh, terima kasih atas kesetiaannya juga mendengarkan dan semoga yang telah disampaikan oleh Ibu er uh, Ibu Elvia, Ibu Ersa dan Bu Devi memberikan manfaat bagi Bapak Ibu semua partisipan yang ada di sini selanjutnya saya kembalikan kepada Mbak Monika, silakan.